point one. Thank you. I now call officers from the NBN Co. Uh, the committee has received a letter from Mr. Quigley advising of his. No, 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 we've got to do 1.1. Wow, sorry, have I? I well, that, see, I just can't wait to get to NBN. Ah, uh, it's the highlight. <laughs> sorry about that. So I'm not calling NBN. Um, yeah, we're now moving to programme 1.1 uh, broadband and uh, communications infrastructure. I call officers. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Robinson, it seems strange seeing you here. How many yes, public? They are, see, I told you he was coming. That's right, indeed. Um, I try, I tried I'll, I'll try to, to stop you. Senator <laughs> McKenzie from asking questions about environmental water, uh, or myself. That would, that would be good. <laughs> How many public servants were involved in sending articles to journalists or commentators for them to reprint? <laughs> uh, Senator Ian Robinson, I'm Acting Deputy Secretary. Um, uh, I'd have to get the exact numbers of staff involved in our communications effort, but uh, I think you're referring to uh, one incident uh, which, uh, which was reported in the press about an article being drafted. Uh, we've gone back. Christian and... Kerr, who wrote that? I'm not actually sure who wrote the story. <laughs> You're blushing, though, Senator Birmingham. Oh, I don't know. Well, yes, it is. It oh, is. there we go. What a surprise! However, that's okay. I do Are you have... just employing I, I, him? I, I would have thought that the point. You know, Are you the... subcontracting him or employing him directly uh, now? Uh, uh. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Robinson was saying. Uh, uh, we've gone back and had a look at that, Senator, um, and uh, uh, th 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 that was the one incident, as far as we can tell. And um, it actually isn't our practice at all to draft articles under someone else's, someone external to the portfolios uh, or the programs uh, to, so they could put it under their names. Uh, but that was one incident and we'll make sure it doesn't happen again. So Mr Robinson, uh, it was sent by Mr Dennis Godfrey, Senior Communication Advisor, Media and Public Affairs Communication Branch in the Department. Uh, on the 7th of September at 10.51am to James Patterson. Uh, Dear James, I have just written an article about how the national broadband network currently being rolled out across Australia will in many ways be of particular interest to women. It is meticulously researched and would be quite gratis, no fee of course. Please let me know if you are interested. I'd be happy to send it to you for consideration. Sincerely, Dennis. Well, it make a huge improvement on the rubbish they normally print, but... Uh as I've said publicly, Thank the first I uh, knew. I, I know you like to provide editorial commentary <laughs> on uh, um, um, on all manner of, uh, of things printed in the media, Minister. But can I just actually ask a question before yeah, no, you no, so before the, you the first, jump in? As I've any, said, no, no. As I've said, any the first I knew comment. of it was when I think Christian Kerr phoned my office. Uh, Wonderful. And, uh, and as I said, that's well, not that, a practice that we condone. Well, 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 that at least answers one question. That's the first you knew of. Yeah, Christian Kerr um, did phone Mr. the right. Mr. Mr. Robinson, uh, are you suggesting that this is the only incident that this one email was sent to Mr. Patterson and that's the only occasion this practice has occurred? Or was this article sent to multiple um, commentators? Uh, we, we do draft articles, Senator, for under the department's name, and some have been published under the department's name. Uh, we have drafted articles that have gone under, under our broadband champions' names, and we have provided background material in the past about programs, but that is the only example, as far as we can tell, where the officer said, here's an article which you can put under your name to, uh, to a journalist, effectively. Uh, and we've checked. It's not our practice. It was bad practice. Uh, in retrospect, that officer says uh, he just worded his email very badly. Uh, but we've checked and we can't find any and others. James Patterson is the only person he sent it to. That's my understanding, Senator. That, that article, yes. Did you ask Mr Godfrey as to how it came to be that in this 
bad practice um, of all the people uh, in Australia, he chose yeah, no, someone from the IPA. Yeah, yeah. That, did, uh, did, that thought did occur to me so, also, yeah, Senator I, I, This is why I find it rather remarkable to believe this is a solo incident yeah. um, uh, when someone who seems perhaps uh, not an obvious target for <laughs> such communications uh, was the recipient. Well, I'm glad you it. concede that. It's certainly not an obvious target. So <laughs> it, it was a, a, a mistake. It really was have, a mistake. Have, have email records been checked or anything else been assessed? Or, yeah. uh, or, yes. is, uh, yes. or is it just... No, they have, Senator. Yes. They have? They have. Yes. yes. Email records have been checked. Of uh, uh, Mr Godfrey, obviously, of, uh, of others in the media and public affairs in part the, of the communication branch? In the communications area generally. Communications area generally. And, uh, and so no other instances were turned up uh, of this nature from those checks. Uh, did Mr Godfrey explain how he came to target Mr Patterson? Uh, we've had discussions with him, Senator. I mean, he, it's just a mistake, really. Um, he, it wasn't his intention to write the e email like he did, um, but that's, that's what happened. And, um, and we've in fact put on hold, and we, whenever the date of that incident is, we, I mean, we you know, put it's on like hold. You'll say to you occasionally, exactly. "Sorry, Simon, I forgot to change my name off it from your press release." I mean, these things happen. Very droll, <laughs> Minister. Stop interrupting the witness, though. Please. Oh, well, since then we haven't actually uh, issued any articles until we make sure our procedures are right. Um, uh, so you indicated that, uh, that you draft articles for the department's Kirk, name. Yeah, yes, we know you do. Uh, you draft articles for, I, I think it's safe to say Mr Kurt writes far better than I do, uh, Minister. Well, that could be true, but um, someday we might find out. Uh, you draft articles for broadband champions and you draft uh, background material, which I assume is material provided to the Minister and to whoever else might need background material. Um, Perhaps you could explain to me the articles you draft for broadband champions and how many uh, of those are drafted, and I assume they are of similar ilk to uh, um, this amazingly solo incident that just happened to go to Mr Patterson of the IPA. Well, it's, it's I think we provide secretarial services and, and a whole range of services to support our national broadband champions, Senator Birmingham. I think what uh, Mr Robinson is trying to indicate is when the broadband champions um, put out information to the sorts of uh, sectors where their name is well known, they'll seek from us data, uh, up-to-date information on, for example, rollout numbers or um, a particular aspect that might be relevant to small business or that sort of thing, and we will send them back an information uh, pack or a set of data or whatever that may be relevant to what they're developing. That's, that's not what Mr Harris said, though. No, Mr Robinson said Mr Harris. Mr, Har Mr Robinson said that um, you draft <laughs> articles under the department's name and, uh, for the broadband champions uh, and provide background material. Well, that's um, back I'd have, call that background material. Have, has the so department... If we're debating, if we're debating the, um, the nature of the descriptions, that, that's our version has, of what we call background material. Has the department drafted articles for broadband champions that have been reproduced in their names? Um, I don't know. We have said it, yes. Yes. And uh, with, on, under their authority, I mean, obviously they wouldn't put their names to the material if they, they didn't um, yes. agree with it. And uh, on how many occasions has this occurred? Oh, I'd have to take it on notice, Senator. Does the department uh, offer articles to the broadband champions for them to uh, consider uh, using in their different spheres of influence? Uh, I, I'm not sure. What, I don't. Well, not sure well, I understand well, well, your question. Well, well do they that? ask you for things, or do you voluntarily uh, provide them with things? Uh, well, or does we, it work both ways? I think there's iteration uh, involved both in both directions, uh, Senator Birmingham. From my understanding, how many broadband champions are there? It's about twenty, I think. I think it's probably a little bit more than that by now. There's probably... I think it's 22. Yeah, it's, 22. It's, it's gone anyway, It's around 20. 20. 22 broadband champions. Um, and uh, they were... Drawn from a whole range of sectors. And selected how? Uh, look, I think, we, the, I think the department 
uh, we produced a list originally and uh, we approached them whether they'd be willing to participate. And, and, and uh, other people have put their names. Yeah, and others have just volunteered. Subs subsequent to that. So it's, 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 a, it's almost a self-managed uh, group. People, uh, people who are very keen on the NBN, in particular, you know, in either a sector that's very interested in it or a region that's very interested in it. Um, so I'm quite, I know when we developed originally our communication strategy, and, and this is quite a normal part of having a communication strategy, is to have people who are happy to be advocates for it to supply them information in order that they continue to provide their advocacy on an up-to-date basis. I don't, I don't see this as being a particularly unusual event. I see the article being put to a journalist in a form which says the journalist could breach their own standard ethical practices as being very, very unusual. That's why we wanted to check this wasn't a sort of ongoing event. But that's what's unique. It's, it's suggesting to a journalist that you could or should breach an ethical principle that's unique here. The uh, provision of information to um, uh, advocates for uh, significant public causes has been an ongoing event in my experience, Senator, for a, a long, long time. Certainly predates the NBN. What, uh, what does a broadband champion receive when they uh, sign on and agree and the department agrees that they will be a broadband champion? Information. Um, we keep them informed as a regular update oh, channel uh, run out of uh, the NBN, one of the NBN parts of the department uh, to keep them informed on uh, both events that are upcoming and uh, significant milestones or achievements in the NBN so they can conduct themselves in the very manner that we've suggested as advocates for the NBN. Uh, and um, as I said, we provide information to them and some of them, not all of them, are, are, are regular writers of events either in their community newspaper or, or um, uh, through their uh, information activities. Um, uh, for example, running online universities and that sort of thing, and we will give them this information, information relevant to a particular angle that they want to put forward. As I'm sure uh, Mr Ridsley will back me up, this is information that when we announced the champions and who they were, we were providing support services to them in their roles. Uh, and I think we discussed it at length in a previous estimate, Senator Birmingham. I, I think we have canvassed you, you may, something may not have been about here. the champions previously, yep. um, uh, but uh, uh, it is a slightly different sphere uh, if the department is drafting statements uh, for the champions to put out in their own names, uh, that suddenly the department uh, uh, is um, engaging in an activity uh, that um, is perhaps uh, influencing what the champions are saying. Uh, um, ensuring uh, that the broadband champions perhaps achieve either through mainstream media or through other communications channels a, 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 an <laughs> even higher profile. You must be joking. Oh, I'm just <laughs> getting a run of the mainstream media. <laughs> I, I, what, I, what I guess I can't see with this angle of questioning, Senator, is what you otherwise would expect a champion to do. The word expresses the very intent. These people are volunteers. No, well, well, I wouldn't expect them to have to, words put in their mouths. If so. I could finish, Senator, these people are volunteers to advocate for the NBN. It's an angle of a communication strategy, as I said, I think we've seen used quite often. Um, it may not be as formalised as it is in the case of the NBN because it's such a major project and because I think at the end of the day we were, we were trying as part of this... Uh, uh, creation of a, of a group of advocates to ensure that information was provided to areas that were otherwise not going to get much information because they weren't necessarily directed towards the mainstream media. Um, and w I don't see anything don't, to be... I, 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 I'm trying to remember if I've seen across every state. an article in the mainstream media in the last six months uh, by a champion. Uh, Are the 22 spread across every state? The, oh, the they're volunteers, and... so we didn't pick them by saying there must be representatives from every region. You had to there want would, to but, do this. But, but, but you and have an expertise. Up a short list, uh, no, no, and no. I would have thought you'd want some geographical spread for that short list. Are there volunteers in every I state? I don't think we edited well, we're happy to give you the out of it. We're happy to give you the list. It wasn't a question of knocking people back. Uh, but we're happy to give you a list of the champions, where what their sectors are and where they live, if that, you think that's relevant. I'm happy to and, and, give you and, that and, on notice. And, 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 and perhaps we could provide the committee with uh, uh, the communications that go out on a regular basis to the champions. We can provide you with the sorts of information that have been provided through the 
department that I outlined earlier, Senator, so that you can see it. But it is, it is not a question of um, creating some artificial signature on the bottom of an article. It's an information okay. provision and advocacy not, role. Not, not just the sorts of information that the actual would be handy, Mr Harris. Uh, now, we did canvass with NBN Co last time round, and they took on notice the matter of a billboard in the Los Angeles International Air Terminal promoting the NBN. And I must have missed they that. They indicated some awareness of its existence, but in response to questions on notice, made clear that it was not of their doing. Does the department have any knowledge of the mysterious billboard and how it came no, to be I, in no, LAX? I, I think I've seen the one you're referring to. Uh, I'm not sure it was by us. No, from recollection. I think by us. There is, first, there's a company in uh, the US who I have met with called NBN. Uh, and so I don't think this has got anything to do with us. We're happy to triple check for you. I have but seen that it's, it was in the department, um, Senator. It, my understanding is the company did it entirely of its own bat. Of I've, bat. I've yeah. seen an ad myself, uh, not in um, in Canada, in Canada, but not, yeah. not in the US, but in Canada, okay. for exactly the right. same uh, purpose. Right. It's because the National Broadband Network has a global reputation. <laughs> does actually have a global reputation. That, that, that others are advertising it? Well, that others uh, are prepared to endorse. I, Let, let's I, be quite I, clear I, about well, it. Steve Wozniak well, well, said well, in well, the well, financial well, review... Senator Connery is saying... Wozniak was said he was moving to Australia because you of the NBN write, in the financial review. You don't write in, in your ad, hooray for something I don't like. Well, you don't usually advertise other products either. It's an unusual so, step. Senator Birmingham, it's, um, it's reflective of its global reputation. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mr Harris, I, I note there was an article in the Townsville Bulletin on Saturday, just gone, which appears to be in response to a press release by Senator Macdonald that says that the Copper Network oh will be unexpectedly switched oh, off in 18 months. Can you just uh, inform the committee if that is if that article is right? That was was this announcement unexpected? <laughs> and also, why are we decommissioning the copper network in fibre areas 18 months after these areas are passed by MBN Co? Uh, in answer to your question, Senator. Um, We've certainly done our best, and NBN Co has done its best, uh, to make clear that the agreements with uh, Telstra effectively create the outcome of structural separation. Structural separation, OK, it's a, it's a term that uh, is loved by competition policy analysts, I guess, um, but the, uh, the nature of the media response to the structural separation agreements and to the uh, definitive agreements with Telstra, between Telstra and NBN Co, uh, the out of media that's been written about it that basically has made clear that the network must transfer from Telstra to NBN exchange area by exchange area and that necessarily for that to occur and for Telstra to give up its network it will be depowering its copper over time as NBN Co's fibre is ready to replace it. And I guess that's been for the better part of two years. Um, two years. The plan. Oh. Uh, and a plan that has been um, done through first by financial heads of agreement and then through definitive agreements and then by structural separation undertaking agreed um, with the uh, ACCC. So uh, we can always do more to make it clear that this is, the, the copper is shutting down and in that sense I welcome the publicity um, and I'd like to see it written up uh, continuously um, to help us out because advertising is the only other way we get to put this message out clearly and advertising isn't necessarily a popular um, mechanism, uh, although it is part of a formal communication strategy which logically is used for every big infrastructure project that I've ever worked on uh, to ensure that people are aware of this. Um, in terms of the benefits you get from this, structural separation is an article of faith supported by the entire telecommunications industry, including now signed up to, contracted to Telstra. So the industry sees the value of effectively seeding over time the network from a, uh, being in the hands of a party which should necessarily take commercial advantage of it because they own it, that is Telstra, and putting it in the hands of a neutral party, that is NBN Co. Um, and the benefits that you gain from that are the benefits uh, that you gain from uh, allowing 
all kinds of opportunities and innovations to be applied by um, any carrier without fear of the fact that they may have impediments put in their way by an entity that controls and manages the network and isn't able to take the greatest advantage of, of those innovation opportunities. So that's the, that's the sort of pro-competitive side of things. Um, in terms of the actual management of the network, we have to be fairly clear, the copper network itself is degrading and is expensive to operate, and I think a lot of analysts in the last 12 months have written this up quite clearly. I've seen as recently as uh, you know, the last few days, I think in Telstra's results today, people commenting on the fact that the copper network itself is increasingly expensive to maintain and that Telstra has done a pretty big favour for itself by seeding this and maintenance of this uh, function long term, not maintenance of the network, because the copper network's being replaced, but maintenance of the function long term to a party like NBNCO, upon which, creating a platform on which everybody can operate equally. So that's the kinds of benefits that, he, that come out of this. We've got a, we'd have a pro-competitive environment, and we would have a, um, an environment in which Telstra has given up the responsibility of managing something which increasingly is going to be expensive and unreliable to manage in the long term. Uh, so we, we welcome the publicity. Um, we'd like to see more articles written that make it clear that over time, as exchange areas are converted to fibre, Telstra will be depowering the network and people therefore have to make a choice. They have to decide to join the NBN network or, as we've discussed earlier in the uh, discussion that we're having under TUSMA, uh, a little earlier this evening in this committee, um, or they can decide to remain as a voice-only customer and we will continue to make sure that, that service is provided to them via, via TUSMA. But one way or the other, a choice must now be made as NBN Co ra rolls out the fibre. As the copper network um, shuts down. Yes. And that, as you said, that's been two years in the, Roughly two in years. the making. Roughly two so years. it's not really unexpected that it's t shutting down in 18 months. I would hope it isn't unexpected and, as I said, but we welcome the idea of the most publicity that you can get for a senator okay. and so I continue to say this All and right. hope that someone else will write up the copper <laughs> network is going to be depowered over time and will be shifting to a national broadband network. So, Mr Harris, does this copper disconnection help MPNCO achieve its rate, um, its return for taxpayers? Well, in inherently, um, for, in for NBNCO, uh, its task is to create the network itself. Um, clearly, if, if customers, if some customers were able to remain on, on uh, a Telstra-based network and those customers were high-value customers, then you would lose the ability to cross-subsidise, uh, which is an inherent part of the NBN operation that we're effectively cross-subsidising from high-value customers in the city to uh, customers who are much more expensive to serve in the bush so that there is a single basic entry price for everybody across the country. So to have a, a what I call a balkanised network, you know, a chunk of copper here, a chunk of copper there, fibre here, somebody else operating a separated network, the more that that takes from NBNCO the ability to cross-subsidise between the high-value customers and the low-value customers, the less likely it is that there will be either uh, the rate of return that you referred to, which is in the NBN corporate plan, or even the ability ultimately to cross-subsidise such that it's a single price for the basic entry product no matter where you are in Australia. So that's okay. inherently part of the public policy model. So if I'm a voice-only customer, um, as you referred to earlier, you yep. could be under Twisma, um, and I, so I don't want broadband, will there be any cost to me for migrating to the MBN? Uh, the Tuzma operation will uh, pick up responsibility for your in-house wiring and NBNCO uh, will put the, effectively the uh, network terminating device on your wall. So uh, just as the um, uh, in-house in uh, uh, wiring work or whatever is required um, for a broadband customer will be picked up by the internet service provider where you're obviously not wanting an internet service provider because you're going to remain voice only, Tourism will have responsibility for you. So you'll end up with all the parties who take up the NBN service, regardless of whether they're a voice customer or, or a broadband customer, will get the basic service uh, at no charge. So it's not outrageously expensive? It's at no charge? It's at no charge. And OK. And... Uh, don't. Uh, and what about monthly plans? Is there any regulation on Telstra or anyone else to ensure that voice-only customers will pay no more on the NBN than they would pay now? For example, like 
for people on low incomes? Uh, as a voice only customer, you remain you retain the current protections that are available in the with the uh, telco pricing model, so that those protections remain in place. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Sorry, if, uh, just before we finish, if I yeah. could just clear up the uh, the mystery ad, which apparently has been in Chicago, Canada, uh, as well as LA. Uh, it's actually an ad not paid for or anything to do with NBN Co. Uh, here in Australia. Uh, it's a company that is supplying services uh, to NBN Co here in Australia. Uh, their ad reads, Emerson provides critical technology support for delivery of broadband service across Australia and a kangaroo. Uh, they go on to explain that they are selected to design, supply, install and commission 10 network hubs referred to as aggregation nodes that will serve as a foundation for the continent spanning network. And the ad goes on to say, Emerson is helping to put Australia at the forefront of high-speed connectivity. Uh, and frankly, I could read onwards and onwards, uh, but I thought uh, just to save the committee's time, I might uh, get some copies and table it for you. Uh, so the mysterious ad uh, that you and I both noticed uh, is actually a company that's supplying to the National Broadband Network and seem to be very, very proud of it. Well, thanks. I'm sure they're happy to get paid for it. I'd like to see that ad. I'm just getting everyone a copy of it now. In fact, there's a video. I, I, how do you table a video ad? Uh, is my question. Can we That's have we got digital hensard yet, so I can have the too. digital ad put in? Well, Senator uh, Conroy, if your office can't handle it, we're all in trouble. <laughs> it's um, on its way, I am sure, um, as we speak. Thank you. That uh, completes uh, program 1.1. I thank the officers for their attendance. I now call officers from the NBN Co. Can I just indicate the committee has received a letter from Mr Quigley advising of his inability to attend today, and uh, that's been discussed by the, uh, the committee. Mr Chairman, uh, mm. just while yep. people are coming, can I just thank Senator Singh for again drawing attention to my emails? I remember when she was a staffer, she gave me that wonderful line, where's Macca? which I use now, thanks to you, Senator Singh. That was your media release back in those days. Yeah, I'm thanks, eternally Senator grateful Donald. to you. Uh, welcome, Mr Cooney. Where are you? Here you are. Uh, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, I would. Thank you. Just introduce yourself. Yes. Everybody? Uh, I think that's been revealed to the committee. Okay, uh, Mr. Cooney. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Cameron. I would like to make an opening statement. I understand that time is short, um, so I'll keep it brief. My name is Karen Cooney. I am the Chief Communications Officer at MBN Co. And I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Mr. Jim Hassel and Mr. Gary McLaren. Mr. McLaren is the Chief Technology Officer, and Mr. Hassel is our Head of Product Management and Industry Relations. Firstly, as was mentioned, Mike Quigley has asked me to pass on his apologies that he was unable to be here in person. Um, he had planned to be here, but um, his absence is due from a scheduling error. Um, as, you, as you probably know, he's never missed a Senate estimates, and I understand he wrote to the committee apologising and offering to uh, appear next week if there was any objections to That's the three of us. Under control. I, I had that information, but the committee has discussed it, so fantastic. should just move on, I think. No problem. There were four areas I wanted to cover in the opening statement and their key developments since we last addressed the Senate estimates. Uh, first of all, it's the lodgement of our corporate plan. Second of all, lodgement of our SAU, or Special Access Undertaking an overview of how the progress of the rollout is going, and third of all, the developments in greenfields, which maintain to be one of the more challenging areas of the project. So to the first point in terms of the corporate plan, in August, the government released our corporate plan, um, and in the days and the, the weeks that led up, there was a fair amount of speculation as to what the document would contain. Uh, but in the end, the big news was, was there was really no new news. In the end, it, it really reaffirmed the fundamentals of the project, and that in the, we are still on track to connect 
every Australian premise in the remaining nine years of this 10-year construction build. We're still on track to commence or complete construction in 758,000 premises by the end of this year and 3.5 million premises by midway through 2015. <coughs> Excuse me. And as well as providing a vastly superior broadband experience for all Australians, we also reaffirmed our commitment to reduce our broadband prices in real terms. The plan also included changes since the original corporate plan, such as the, ACCC, sorry, such as the uh, Optus decision, uh, the Optus deal, uh, and also the move to the more efficient bill drop mechanism, whereby we actually connect to the house with fibre as we're rolling fibre down the street. And although these changes did increase the capital expense of the project, they also increased the revenues. And the net, the net effect was that uh, the, the return, the internal rate of return to the Australian public stayed there or thereabouts from the original plan at around 7%. The second point that I wanted to raise was around the SAU, or the Special Access Undertaking. This is a 600 plus page document that spans 30 years that covers the key terms and conditions that telecommunications service providers go through in order to gain access from the NBN. It also covers the regulation, the regulatory obligations from the ACCC over NBN's uh, cost, uh, build of our cost. In the first case, what it did was commit us to a five-year price freeze on key products, key reference products within our mix. And future price freezes and, and, and future price increases are pegged uh, below the inflation rate. And what that commitment effectively does is it shows a real drop in prices of wholesale broadband in real terms. Now, there was, I read in some media reports, some criticism that we had gone back and changed the document that we originally submitted in December. But talking to our customers, working with the ACCC, working with the government to understand the varying views and then coming to a single workable way forwards is what this process was all about. Because yeah, the SAU is a centrepiece of telecommunications regulation for the fixed line world in an MBN era. And it needs to balance the needs of both retail service providers, of the MBN as a wholesale service provider, and most importantly, in consumers. Now, Mr. Hassel and his team led the consultation with industry, with ACCC and with government, and he'll be uh, available to take any questions that you have on this throughout the night. The third point that I was going to cover was our progress with the rollout of the NBN itself. And we've seen strong progress against key metrics, and there are three that I was going to touch on specifically. Number one, the number of premises where construction is commenced or completed. Number two, the number of premises that we've passed. And number three, the number of premises that we've activated. So the first one, in terms of construction commenced or completed. At the end of the last quarter, so in September, we had commenced or constructed or commenced or completed construction on 569,000 premises across every state and territory in Australia. That puts us on track to fulfil our end of year very public commitments of 758,000 by the end of this year and 3.5 million, or roughly a third of the country, by midway through 2015. Um, and it's also worth noting that we're putting on new areas all the time. Just yesterday we released the next 66 street level maps that cover the next 66 areas where the NBN is being built, comprises of 165,000 premises. Uh, and to be absolutely clear, when we say commenced, that's exactly what we mean. That is the first time at which construction crews are going out into the community and beginning rotting and roping and beginning the actual construction process in the community, often closing off streets as part of it. So the second measure is premises passed. Now this is where we've completed the network in the area and homeowners or business owners can now connect to the MBN. At the end of the last quarter, we had that number was 230,000 premises. And we should be very clear here is 165 of that is in the existing interim satellite footprint. So if you take that out, the remaining 65,000 is where people can connect with the fibre or the fixed wireless. It's probably worth putting that in a little bit of context as well. So 65,000 as of the end of, at the beginning of September, um, back at the end of FY11, that was 18,000, the end of FY12, that was 48,000. 
And three weeks ago, we just added our latest area, and that was in South Morang in North Melbourne, or north of Melbourne. And that's an additional 2,300 premises that can connect to the network. And in the short period since that's been live, around 10% of the South Morang community have signed on to the MBN. So you can start to get a sense that we're really starting to build up the momentum, but one of the key measures is clearly the amount of Australians that are actually connected to the MBM, and that's our last measure, or uh, premises activated. Now, back in uh, June, we had 14,000 end users on the network. Three months later, that's 24,000. So 10,000 over the three months. But to give a sense of the growth, it's probably worth stepping back in time, really, to the beginning for us, to give a sense of the exponential growth. If we go back to April last year when we switched on Armadale and we had a grand title of five end users. Sorry? Don't be distracted. Just flick the big switch with nothing up to it. <laughs> we, had, we had a grand total of five end users. Over the next nine months, that increased by 800 fold to 4,000 by the end of the year. Over the following nine months, that increased by six fold to 18,000. And in the, uh, sorry, to 24,000, which is where we are right now. And over the next nine months, it needs to increase by fourfold to reach our end of financial year target of 92,000. Now, Mike Quigley has often talked about a period of scaling up that follows the, the learnings from a, the, the trial periods and the design periods, and as those start to bed down. And I think you can see that we are well and truly starting to see that momentum where 10,000 people have joined the MBN in the last quarter alone. And we're also starting to get information about what services end users are starting to choose on the MBN. You may remember last time we talked about that 38% were choosing the uppermost tier, our 140 plan. And we felt then, as we feel now, that to a certain degree that is a reflection of early adopters. But I can update you that that number has increased. It is now 44% of end users are choosing that top plan. And finally, I wanted to touch on greenfields. There's no doubt that fibering up the big housing estates right across the country is a massive undertaking. It's probably one of the most logistically difficult elements of the project. And since we have assumed responsibility for this over 18 months ago, we've received requests from developers that span over three years that cover about 150,000 lots from almost 2,900 locations. And Mr Quigley has mentioned previously the difficulties inherent in greenfields. Namely, in a lot of cases, we're not only connecting homes within these estates, we also have to connect backhaul so the residents can receive broadbands from their service provider. We also have to provide power, and often that's quite a challenge in the more remote areas. We have to negotiate with developers to gain access to their infrastructure, and the pits and pipes. And last of all, we have to work with the developers in terms of the actual dates when people are going to move in. And what we've found, by our estimation, is around 43% of those dates have actually been pulled forwards, which just makes the job that much harder. Now, all these factors have contributed to a backlog in orders that we're now endeavouring to fill. But I saw a figure quoted recently that suggested it was somewhere in the order of 74,000 homes. Um, I can said that? No, don't answer that. I, I can reassure you that it's a fraction of that. Currently, it is around 3,000. to ask questions? Or? Yeah. He did uh, indicate he had an opening statement. Will. Well, it's yeah. been yeah. going 15 yeah. minutes. It's well. not been going 15 so minutes. Has, it started at 8.30. Yeah, it started after 8.30 because I was still talking at 8.30. Yeah. So it's carry on, Mr. Cooney. Currently on, it's, it's around 3,800, so about 5% well, of the, the numbers that have been quoted. And it's also important to note that all homeowners are able to access communication services under the, and it was previously mentioned by Mr Harris as we were coming in, the universal service obligation, where they're able to get a voice service via Telstra. So in the meantime, we're taking steps to make sure that we clear the backlog. For instance, priority has been given to occupied estates with held orders. Cross-company teams, including construction, network operations and business operations, are working on reduced timeframes for service deliveries into these particular developments. And we can do this because since the last time we met, the company has awarded contracts to Vision Stream and Service Stream to provide additional rollout capacity in greenfields. These contracts, finalised in June, are worth $183 million over nine months. That's allowed us to increase exponentially the construction instructions, or CIs, that we submit. And just to give you a sense of that, in the last two months, we have submitted as many CIs as we had in the previous 12. 
We've set up a construction task force to tackle the critical issues of backhaul and power in the regional estates. And NBN has, a, has embraced a decoupled approach. And what that basically means is for key, for key parts of the build, instead of working in series, we're working in parallel. We're also working with developers to ensure that customers within their uh, developments are aware of updates. So what that means is that as someone buys a premise or moves into a premise, they're given a pack which encourages them that if they want to find out more information, they can register with our contact centre. At that point, they are able to find out when an estimated time is available, and every month we will update them with any changes, and when a service is available, we'll proactively contact them. So Greenfields is a considerable task, and we don't shirk from it. With this new approach in terms of additional capacity, greater coordination, and prioritising estates with held order. Well, uh, just, just thought, uh, Senator McDonald, this, uh, uh, we're getting the opening statement here. I'm trying hard to hear it. If you've got a conversation you want to undertake, could you do it oh, outside? S same as you, same for you. Do, 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 uh, you have a timeline yeah. that's acceptable for an opening statement? Um, well, you know, Graham, Samuel, Samuel, I think Graham Samuel set the record at 45 minutes once. Yeah. Well, I think but that's I, unacceptable. I'm we, confident we have that, I'm, that, that was needed. done to me. I'm saying uh, Mr. Cooney, I'm sure just, I'm in the home home is almost I'm in the summer. Mr Cooney, how, how much longer have you got? Maybe two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. We break for a cup of tea shortly, Mr So in summary, in the past quarter we have commenced construction. We have passed more premises and we have activated more families and businesses than in any other quarter in the, in, the, in the project. In the past fortnight, the process has begun. In the 15 areas to switch from the old copper lines to fibre in an 18-month time period commencing in November. We're doing everything we can to ensure a smooth transition, including regular series of communications with residents about how easy it is to switch, what the steps are and the benefits they'll enjoy. I'm sure there'll be issues along the way, uh, there always seems to have been, but this is a complex task that we've been asked to undertake. But I want to impress upon you, Senators, that we have put in place a business model and a mechanism that is already opening greater competition in Australia's fixed line infrastructure. Uh, just hold on. Senator MacDonald, if you want to keep interrupting, I will adjourn, because it's unfair on the people presenting for you to continually interrupt. You've been around long enough to know that this will get <laughs> this will be done more effectively if you behave yourself. Well, I'm Mr. simply Chairman, asking you to behave yourself. Can I take a point of order? Can I take a point of order, please? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, the the witnesses now impressing upon or arguing a case. We're here to ask questions about the financial it's not aspects point of, order. Carry of on, this. Mr. And Mr. Chairman, it's not a point of order. I know the truth hurts. I know the truth hurts. It's not a point of order. But you just have to listen. You're actually getting some facts, I suppose, the rubbish you spent. So my, my final sentence is that so the, national, the rollout of the National Broadband, Broadband Network is well underway and continues to gather momentum to achieve not only our short-term targets, but also the complete rollout by 2021. Thank Thanks you. for that excellent opening statement. Uh, Mr. Bir Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Chair, can I just note that I think we go through this every single time with NBN Co. Uh, that an opening statement of some considerable length is given. Uh, and every time opposition senators have expressed concern about it, and it seems that NBN Co are tone deaf to those concerns, and the fact that Sorry, uh, in these last hearings... Last time you people wrote would to Mr Quigley and said we'd like you to... And, and, and people would rather... And you actually wrote... Minister, to come on! Mr Quigley. Come on. Yeah. Min yeah. Minister, would you just like to have a whole night of talking would over each like, other? Would you like to uh, ask a question? If this, if this continues, I would, then ask Senator the question. Senator Birmingham, if this continues, I'm adjourning. I'm, a, I'm adjourning. Minister, allow Senator Birmingham to ask questions. Here Senator here. Birmingham, if you could desist from making statements and ask questions oh. that you've been asked to make. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Chair. Now, can I come to the NBN monthly ready for service rollout plan, which I understand the latest update was put on the NBN website on October. October 12 being last Friday, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, it notes that in Brownfields areas, the NBN is scheduled to pass uh, 231,000 premises across Australia by June 30, 2013. Is that correct? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's right. I believe that's right. right. <coughs> okay. uh, which is uh, in addition to the 29,000 Brownfields premises passed as of the release of the August corporate plan. So a total of uh, 260,000 
households to be passed by June 30, 2013. That sounds all correct to you? I'll just confirm that. We're happy to just confirm that for you, Senator Birmingham. Check out the website, so, so it was Brown Pills, was it Senator Birmingham? That's right. 286, is it? 260 is what I was suggesting, 231 uh, new in addition to 29 that had been done by August. Yes, in our, in our corporate plan, what you'll see is um, in FY13, if TTP brownfields will be 286,000. Uh, uh, that I do understand is in the corporate plan. Uh, my question was about what was in the uh, monthly ready for service rollout plan released last Friday. So I you think those, those comments are right? Yes, I'm just yes. not right for the question. So, uh, so sorry, I was just saying that I think Senator Birmingham's comments were right. I'm just waiting for the question. I can tell you what the question is in a second. Uh, has, how many Brownfields premises has NBN Co passed since August when 29,000 premises had been passed? Sorry, could you repeat that? How many Brownfields premises has the NBN passed since August when you had a figure of 29,000 premises passed? Since August? That wouldn't have changed. That August includes all of the latest um, sites that we've added on since April of this year. So there's been a number of sites which we've added on since April of this year. Triabunna, Sorrell, Deloraine, Kingston Beach, St Helens, Georgetown in Tasmania and South Morang as well. So they were all completed by August Senator in the Brownfields rollout. Was that the question? Well, the question was have any <coughs> additional areas been passed since August? No additional um, areas have been added since then, no. We've had uh, South Morang and uh, well, we've also had um, yeah, Armadale as well. Now. So there has certainly oh, sorry, been pardon, extra Marang. premises yeah. during the month of September. Yes. We definitely added premises. Yes. How many? South Morang was 2,300. We had all the statistics before. Be Currently, it's very straightforward. Mm. Forget the facts. Mm. We don't guess. We don't reckon we're working on to be the case. I don't know how you feel about it, Senator Birmingham. While they're looking for this, um, uh, well, what somebody can find, it. do you want to continue on? We'll come back to that. They all look very busy looking for it. Chair? Uh, but, I mean, it's. 20, 29,000 premises passed as of August. We're now, what's today? So, Straight, the 16th of October. How many have been passed since then? So the total number is 32,295. 32,295. So if, if we can just go through your statistics, that would give you the correct information. If you could just go through it again for us, Senator Birmingham. Senator Birmingham, I'm just asking yep. you to repeat the question so that we can make sure we get the exactly correct information for you. Okay, so simple question uh, for this one was um, 29,000 premises were passed as of the August 2012 corporate plan. How many have now been passed? 32,295. 32,295 have been passed uh, in the period, uh, in the two months since the August corporate plan. Uh, so that's an additional uh, 3,295 premises. Uh, so in the two months since August, you've passed 3,295 premises, uh, yet by June 30 next year, you're going to get to 286,000 premises passed. Is that correct? Yes. I think it's called a ramp up. It's one hell of a ramp up, Minister. Yes, congratulations. You've won a prize. Well, given yes, congratulations. Given, we are given how many, Minister, how many, that every other target set has failed to be met on time, and we announced yesterday uh, 130,000 new 
maps worth of premises yesterday yeah, or Minister, the day you're before. You're great at releasing maps. The questions are about actual rollout. Uh, well, they're connected just last time I checked. Uh, well, it seems to date, given the progress to date, they're not quite so well connected. Uh, we'll meet the 758,000 under construction or completed by the end of the year that we announced in February, March, and Malcolm Turnbull said in, we'd never in, do it, in, and in he'll the hold last us two, to that. In the last two months, you've managed to pass 3,295 premises. How many will you pass by the end of this calendar year? Okay. How many will we pass by the end of the calendar year? How quick is this ramp up? <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's completely linear. That's the trick about this rollout. It's a linear rollout. Uh, by the end of this calendar year, it'll be 54,300. 54,300, okay. So, obviously, uh, perhaps are you able to table a month by month schedule to give us a feeling as to how you get from 32,295? Uh, to 286,000 uh, in the period of uh, around about eight months or so? No, I, I don't have a month by month schedule here. We're scheduled to reach 286,000 by June 2013. It's not linear, Senator Birmingham. Yes, uh, well, 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 it's very, it's very clearly you, not, it's very clearly it's, not linear. I'm Minister. glad you've worked that out because um, when you do very your months clearly and your maths, that, uh, whether it's likely to be when you do your months and your maths, you've got to understand can what I, can a rollout. Just, just a bit of order. Look, um, both Senator Conroy and Senator Birmingham, I mean, you both start talking over each other. It's not an appropriate thing for either of you to do. So I'm simply asking, if a question is put, then allow people to answer the question. And if people need me to get someone under control, I will. But it's almost impossible if the both of you keep yelling over each other. OK. Uh, Mr Hassel, you said you can't provide a month-by-month -month, um, schedule for the period to June 30. Can you provide a quarterly schedule or you, you could just give me a figure for the end of this calendar year? So I assume you've got it in some type of breakdown. Yeah, and, and that's most of that <coughs> information is public information. It's provided on the website. So, and Senator, the information you referred to that you saw, <coughs> excuse me, on Friday also includes our ready for service dates. So it includes our anticipated ready for service dates. We publish those and update them on a regular basis. And you can see from that how the rollout progresses. Um, as Senator Conroy has said, that, that is um, quite a ramp up that we're going through at the moment. So it, it increases um, significantly um, through the first half of next year. In your original corporate plan, do we really have to revisit the original In the original corporate, corporate plan. plan by June 2013... You said we wouldn't, that we'd have started nine months before yeah. we yeah. actually yeah. started. Senator Conroy, allow Senator Birmingham to ask his question. In the original corporate plan, it indicated there would be 1.268 million premises passed by June 2013. We're now talking about uh, 286,000 premises being passed. Uh, and you're having us believe that it will all be done somewhere six months down the track. Isn't the problem that, to date, it's always been six months in the future and never actually in the here and now? Well, I think if you want to revisit the original corporate plan, which was based on estimates on a starting date, that because of the negotiations with Telstra, the ACCC's intervention on poise, and a range of factors like that. I'm happy to spend all evening I, debating I, that. I, I didn't but make you, you uh, set those set times. If you, want, if if you want to order. have that debate, I'm happy to waste everybody at the committee's time. But if you actually want to find out what's really happening today, then let's have a conversation about the facts, rather than you trying to pretend that the old corporate plan from 2010 somehow bound us when we didn't start on the date that it said. It moved backwards by nine months, as in moved in time, the start date. 
The ramp up is still the ramp up. It's not linear. M Minister, you were very happy to boast about everything in the old corporate plan when it was released. And I don't and know if you've noticed. It to the hill. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm boasting about we're going to meet the 758,000 <laughs> that Malcolm Turnbull said we wouldn't <laughs> meet. So, so, trust me this time. No, <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull said back in February. Order. Let me read it to you. He was asked by David Spears. I, now, if I she, meaning NBN, cannot said, deliver, Minister. then she will. The NBN will have completely failed. About what Malcolm Turnbull said. We'll Minister. have completely failed. Well, we're going to hit the 758,000 target, so get used to it. We're going to hit it. And we will not have failed, as Malcolm Turnbull and your side of politics claim. Okay, get we've now used to it. Order, Senator Conroy, we've reached at 9 p.m. That's the uh, spe specified break. We will we'll adjourn and reconvene 9.15 p.m.
Okay, we will uh, recommence. I've got two um, documents that have been tabled. One is the uh, kangaroo, it's never been done before. And the other is the uh, kangaroo with the Estee Lauder ad in the background. So somebody moved the tabling, it's been moved. You, uh, you brought it up, Senator Birmingham? I'm afraid, kind of tabled. Just Senator back. Conroy. Um, we will now move to Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Can I just return, um, gentlemen, to the monthly ready for service rollout plan and just confirm the figures that I think we went through before the break that may have gotten lost a little in the bluster. Uh, that is that um, in the August 2012 corporate plan, 29,000 brownfields premises had been passed. And from the monthly ready for service rollout plan uh, uh, released, it indicates that a further 231,000 premises will be passed between now and June 30 next year. Are those two statements correct? <laughs> uh, Senator Birmingham, uh, if you could just ask questions in a way that doesn't try and put words into people's okay, mouths, okay, that fine, would be good. Fine. Were, did the corporate plan state that 29,000 brownfields premises have been passed? Yes. Yes. Is it correct, as you advised us before the break, uh, that a further 3,295 premises have been passed since the release of the corporate plan, bringing your current total of brownfields premises passed to 32,295 premises? I'll let you in on a secret, Senator Birmingham. To work out how many premises are passed at the end of a process. Yeah. Sorry, I get to answer the questions unless I pass them on, Senator Birmingham. That's the rules. So you do have to listen to my answer. And I'm trying to help you at the moment. So what you have to do is you look backwards 12 months and you see the contracts, construction processes that commenced. Okay? So the past figure, as in past homes, is based on by definition, going back 12 months and looking what was issued back 12 months ago. So what goes into the future is based on what's been issued in the last few months and, more importantly, over the next few months, including this week. So where you get to in 12 months' time, on average, is based on what's been released over the last few months and in the coming months. So to try and say that, well, only X has happened today ignores that you've got to go back 12 months. So I'm hoping I'm explaining to you Hopefully, the Minister, process and, and, by and, which... And, and, and if you can just... You asked me to ask yeah, very no, no. precise questions. I asked a precise question. I'd like a precise answer. Am I going to get one or do I have to ask the question again? I think uh, Mr Hassel said yes. Mr Hassel said yes when I asked whether there were 29,000 premises passed as at the August 2012 corporate plan. When I subsequently asked whether since then 3,295 premises have been passed, bringing the current total of premises passed to 32,295, you interrupted, Minister, uh, rather than providing a precise answer. Is it correct that now 32,295 premises have brownfields premises have been passed. Yes. Thank you. Is it correct that the NBN monthly ready for service rollout plan updated on the NBN website last Friday indicates that in the period to 30 June next year a further 231,000 brownfields premises will be passed. Uh, yes, I believe that is, yes. And it indicates that by June next year, it'll be 286,000 passed. So, as I said, it's not linear, Senator Min Birmingham. Min 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 it's Minister, a ramp up. Minister, Mr. was it Mr Hassel or Mr Cooney? Sorry, I was, was Mr Hassel who said it is correct that the NBN monthly ready for service rollout plan updated on the NBN website just last Friday shows that 231,000 premises will be passed between
between its release and June 30, 2013. Mr Hassell indicated that's correct and he's nodding to reaffirm that indication. So if 32,295 premises have been passed to date and the latest monthly ready for service rollout plan released by NBN Co just last week indicates that 231,000 premises will be passed between now and June 30 next year. Does that not mean then that by June 30 next year, according to what you've done and what your latest rollout plan indicates, there will be some 263,295 premises passed? Sorry, by June 2013. June 30, next year. What is, yes, we got perhaps, the perhaps I can <coughs> answer the question then. So, uh, so that's, that's right. When we pro, um, produce the ready for service and the rollout um, plan, which is the one you were referring to, which was produced last Friday, the dates that we provide in that are the ones that we've um, finalised and had agreed with construction partners, which we know that we'll complete on. Our target for the year is 286,000. That's what we're aiming for in the corporate plan. We don't put everything <coughs> in there if we haven't finalised a date. So we know we've got those um, uh, premises covered, that um, 262,000 or 263,000. And then with the remaining premises, we'll bring forward from a number of different um, uh, constructions that we've got underway to achieve the 286,000. So we want to give some very precise numbers in those ready for service plans as we as we put them out. Yeah. So, so Mr. Hassel, you're acknowledging there's a gap of 23,000 between what your ready for service rollout plan indicates and what the corporate plan indicated would be achieved by June 13 next year. Not in the slightest. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm not accepting the way you're constructing the mathematics. Uh, and you're clearly not listening to the answers that you've got and you're trying to put words into Mr Hassel's mouth. Mr Hassel, I think, was attempting to provide an explanation for that gap. I'm just looking for a confirmation that that gap exists. I think the mathematics are actually pretty straightforward and clear for all to see. And so, and so as I said, our plan is to get to 286,000 premises passed as per the corporate plan. Um, we um, have a plan in place to do that. We provide the ready for service dates for those ones uh, that we know and we have agreed and we've got finalised and we've got locked down with our contractors. Um, and then for the addition, we'll bring those through um, with the other work that we've got underway. Bring those through with the other work that you've got underway. So 286,000 is a target, but at present uh, you don't have secure arrangements with your providers to get to that target. At present, according to the rollout plan most recently uh, updated, you'll fall 23,000 don't, short. Don't put words into Mr Hassel's mouth. You and might want well, to ask well, him well, 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 what's what the issue what is, what is, is the difference but do between not put words something that into is Mr. in the rollout Hassel's plan mouth. and something that is not in the rollout plan? In in, so in the rollout plan and the ready for the rollout plan and the ready for service, what we cover in those are the completed FSAMs or modules, and um, that we deliver. So when that's completed, that's an average of two and a half thousand premises uh, per module. Um, but we will also provide partial. So not you know. Uh, uh, um, if there's two and a half thousand within a module, we might actually um, release a thousand addresses in a particular module, which will take us up to the 286,000. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Hassel. So uh, it's not a case then that you appear to be saying one thing in one document and something in another document. You're saying that you describe it as a rounding error, I guess, perhaps almost. Uh, no, sorry. I'm. Maybe... Can I can I just quote you from the website you like to quote from there, it says the monthly update indicates clearly at the top, and this is what it says, Senator Birmingham, it's provided for information purposes and intended to be a guide only. A guide only. Well, Mr Hassel has explained to you given, given already 
that it isn't a complete number because not all of it has been completed. Given the experience of the previous corporate plan, yeah, I no. wouldn't even go so far as to describe it as a guide. But yeah, well, that's exactly what it's described as, which you choose not to read out to the committee, thereby deliberately oh. misinforming oh, the committee. Oh, please, Minister. Purposes and intended to be a guide. Excellent. Thank you. Can I, can I move on? Can I ask no, can, about... Sorry, Mr Hassan would like to add some information. So, so, so just in terms of those um, modules, as I say, we don't announce ones that were the, uh, as complete where the module's not fully completed, but there are ho homes passed and ready for service, and that what, that's what makes the difference to take to the 286. Exactly. Uh, as clear as anything around the NBN ever is, Minister. What's um, clear is we're going to hit the target of 758,000. Know, so so you, if, if you keep saying it often enough, maybe somebody other than yourself will believe it, Minister. <laughs> uh, I'm confident that in, on December the 30th, you'll be putting out a press release well, congratulating so you know, uh, NBN. Senator Birmingham, Sen Senator Conroy, I had asked both of you I, I, to I try and desist been, been from this continual you know, ba ba you know, bet you know, debate between both of you and talking over each other. It's not doing the committee any good, and it's not helping this process. So again, I would ask you both to desist. You've got another two minutes. Can I ask about uh, the um, Fiverr serving area modules, the FSAMs that are currently, or, these, or the regions or areas, whatever the normal term might be, that are currently scheduled to have active service areas between now and June 30. Uh, is that 113 areas currently? We'll just get that information for you, Senator Birmingham. Sorry, 113. Sorry, Senator, could you repeat the question, please? Could you tell us your source? <coughs> it might help. Once again, we're working through the uh, monthly ready for service rollout plan, but uh, uh, and between now and June 30, how many FSAMs are scheduled to have active services? Is it 113? If you're reading that from the um, rollout plan on, from last week, then that's the case, but we can check on that, sure. Right, we'll, just have, we'll just get that information so we can be completely correct for you. Senator Birmingham. I wouldn't want to mislead you. It wouldn't be misleading me, it'd be misleading the committee. <laughs> Can we come back to you on that? In a few moments. Okay, what, um, what I intend doing now is going to Senator Ludlam and Maybe you can have that number by the time Senator Ludlam's finished that. Ludlam. Great, thanks. So I don't have a huge amount, and some of my stuff's already been asked. Um, I'm presuming it's again. Mr Cooney, in your opening statement, um, you spoke briefly of the metrics that you've adopted around early adopters and the people um, getting the highest bandwidth highest packages. Speed tier, yes. Could you maybe table for us a breakout across the different brackets, as I think Mr Quigley might have done for us last time? Um, of, of the, the different cohorts and the packages that they're taking up? Yes, no problem. Actually, um, uh, Mr Hassel is, uh, that probably has a better view of that. This is the breakdown of the speed tiers um, uh, in, in how they compare to our, what we were expecting. Um, yes, so in the uh, fibre footprint um, so far, our, our corporate plan that we'd had um, anticipated that we'd have about 49% of services on the 12-1 wholesale um, uh, at the wholesale level, the entry level uh, product. Sorry, just give us that number again. 49%. Uh, and 28% and, um, on the um, 25 megabits per second service. And 5% on the 50 megabits per second service and 18% on the 100. 40 megabits per second service. 
Now, is it the 18? Is that 18 percent at the top tier? What surprised you a bit? That wasn't in your model, was it? No, it, it, that that was the corporate plan. So that was what we'd actually modelled. What we've actually seen so far is that the top tier, the 140 service, in fact, has attracted 44 percent. Okay. Of services. You predicted 18% at that premium level. We predicted 18. You get nearly half. And yes, nearly half. Okay. It is still too soon to know whether that trend is going to continue or whether you're still just harvesting early adopters who are going bonkers with this stuff. Is that fair? It, it is still too early to say whether that trend is, is going to continue. So we monitor that pretty closely. Um, we'd like to go and complete some areas before we know what that, that will actually be. Um, having said that, we do have some sites with some very high take-up um, levels. So, for example, Kayama is over 40% in terms of take-up. And even in those sites, it's, um, it's still very high. It's 38% at, uh, at the top tier. So we're monitoring closely. And as I say, we, we, it's, it is still early days to say whether that's um, going to continue. Okay. Up. Yeah, of course. Add a little bit to that. Um, the ABS data out last week shows a very significant growth in people, not just NBN obviously, because the NBN network is only just starting to roll out, but taking the existing network shows a, a very significant jump in people seeking speeds of above 24 megabits per second. Some 469,000 in the last year. So we're talking about very big shifts in preferences for higher speed. Okay. Um, and in practice, what it means on fixed lines, fixed lines, is that the share of people looking for those very high speeds has gone from 18% in 2011 to more than 25% now. Sorry, 18% was your model. Oh, sorry, 18 percent NDN's model. No, no, no. I'm just talking about the Australian economy generally oh, okay, yep. and attachment to speed. So I'm saying when you ask Mr. Hassel and he agreed it's early days for the NBN fibre network. I'm just saying you can see a much wider pattern across the economy, generally, of subscribers seeking higher speed product. Obviously, the existing network is limited in its ability to provide that, but the share is shifting quite noticeably. I think it's called Moore's Law. Um, just this might seem a little mischievous, but what's the highest bandwidth? What's the highest speeds that you can get? Just hypothetically, if somebody just parked this entire concept and rolled us into a fibre to the node architecture that relied on a whole heap of copper, what's the highest speeds that you can sustain even with good switching equipment and and fibre to the cabinets? Am I still am I still going to be able to buy into speeds higher than 25? Me? Gary, I'm I'm not the technologist. So That's I'm all right. I've got them right here. Somebody got them here. Is the, um, in a different architecture, it, it depends on a lot of factors. But the, if, the speed if we go to really a fibre to the node architecture that's got cabinets on every street corner fanning out to copper for the last couple of kilometres, mm -hmm. how fast could I sustain on that? It, it comes down to where you can locate those cabinets, how close you can get to the customer. Uh, if you make an assumption that, the, that um, those cabinets uh, are a thousand metres, a kilometre away, then the speeds that you're looking at with today's technology that's used around the world would be, be maybe you'd be able to get to that 25, 30 megabits per second. Oh, but you're saying quite Sorry, a large... that's an average. It depends yeah. on physically. If you're above, if you're at 1,000 metres, you probably can't quite get... Uh, you wouldn't get 25. You'd be lucky, lucky it depend to get on the quality of the copper. depends on the quality of the copper, the length of the loop. It on the infrastructure on the copper. There's a number of different things that would need to be upgraded on the All copper. All right, but the point, I guess, is, is made then. The 44% of MBN Co's retail, ultimate retail customers who are buying into that premium service, that's not going to be able to be offered? It would not be possible, no. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Let's pause and contemplate that for a second. Um, I just wonder whether... Uh, you've, you've tabled it for, for four different... Oh, you haven't tabled, but you've described for us the four different speeds. Um, when... I, I suspect I put this to Mr Quigley last time we asked, but when would you feel you'd be able to make confident predictions of what the ultimate traffic or bandwidth profile is going to be across the whole country? You would really want to have completed the, um, in, a, you know, in a number of regions, you'd really want to have completed the actual rollout and the switch over from copper to the fibre service. Like for a whole town or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When are you going to have all of Geraldton cabled up, for example? This is a place that's very dear to my heart. <laughs> and I was just there recently. You know, I know you were. I, my and invite must have gone missing. It is, uh, it is a very exciting place to be at the moment. Uh, 
Do we have a, a fix on Geraldton, roughly? Yeah, well, I think we might be able to come back roughly, to you on... Yeah, 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 it's, it's not that far away. It's in our program. Yeah. Uh, All right. It's well <laughs> under construction at the moment. They're actually rolling out in the streets of Geraldton at the moment. That's very good. So you've got a town of twenty or 30,000 people all cabled up. Would you be able to say that's a big enough statistically significant representative sample of the population that that would tell you what your overall speed profile is going to be for an NBN customer across the whole country? I, I think we'd want to do a bit more than that, than, than just one town at 20 or 30 yeah, thousand. So different cautious. towns will have different sure. take yeah. in, in I think Mr Hassel's point's the, the valid one, though. Until we actually close the copper network down, yeah. you've potentially got a bulk of people you know, that aren't necessarily interested in the yeah. internet, aren't, and, and they've got to be taken in as part of your overall percentages, and so we're not going to know what they're going to take up until we go through that process. All right. I okay, want... well that's to be continued. I'll probably, I'm going to keep asking about those. I think that's actually quite a highly significant statistic. Yeah, no, it's very encouraging. I think, uh, I think Mr Quigley, Mr Hassel, everyone would say it's a very encouraging sign, but it's too early to make any right. absolute predictions yet. Well, the caution is appreciated. Um, I've got a couple of questions now about the move to build drops, which again, Mr Cooney, you addressed briefly in your opening statement. Um, I want to know how people in rented dwellings or people who are purchasing properties where previous landlords or owners rejected the lead-in, how they um, will be affected. So what happens to premises where, where the lead-in was, was not called for? So if, if someone has, uh, doesn't have a lead-in in the area, they can uh, order one. They are able to notify us and we can uh, later come in and, and deliver that. How much of MBNCO's work is doing that? It's plugging gaps in places that could have been done when, you, when, the, engine, when the cable crews went past initially? Uh, I think our current projection is that about 30% we may have to... I, I can confirm that, but I think our current projection is it's around 30% we'll have to revisit. Um, uh, but it is to be expected is that we won't run a... Not everyone will be available at that time, not everyone will want it, so that we, we expect that there will be some that we'll need to come back into later. But it's the case that as of whenever that announcement was made, um, everything is being cabled up or is, is an opt-out premise now that people can say actually actively I don't want this connection or is it going to every premise? Yeah, if somebody, if somebody notifies us that they don't want it, then we won't, we won't build it onto their premise. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you for that. Um, I've just got some inquiries to make regarding NBN Co's relationship to Fujitsu. Um, I have a press release dated 13 May of 2011 announcing a contract worth $100 million over 12 months uh, that said the sort of um, you know, boilerplate that, that MBN Co was very happy with Fujitsu's capability to do what was, they were going to be asked for. Um, and three contracts to lay fibre, this is particularly with regard to Greenfield to states, Fujitsu, one with Vision Stream and one with Service Stream. What well, can you tell us about the contract with Fujitsu? and NBN Co's current relationship with that corporation. Gary, would you like to...? So, you're correct. We, uh, back in May 2011, entered into a contract with Fujitsu uh, to uh, assist us with managing the, the rollout into Greenfield Estates. We were in a situation there where we needed to buy what we called a managed service. It was pretty much a, what, work, a managed service from oh, yeah. Fujitsu to to not only build that network, but also operate the network after it was put in place. We've now moved to a situation where, because the Brownfields rollout is actually um, extending across the country into many of the areas where our Greenfield estates are happening, our contractors that are being used in our Brownfields rollouts can assist us with the Greenfields. So recently you've seen the introduction, I think you mentioned their names, of uh, Vision Stream Vision and Stream Service, Service Stream, Stream got, yep. into our contract arrangements for Greenfields as well. So has that contract with Fujitsu concluded? Does NBN Co still have a commercial relationship with Fujitsu? Oh, we do. We're still working with Fujitsu that are rolling, continue to roll out uh, into the projects that um, they have worked on since, um, since we commenced with them last year. OK. Did they deliver what they were contracted to do? Did NBN Co get what it, what it wanted out of its $100 million? So, yes, we have obviously worked with Fujitsu to make sure that they deliver... Um, on those, uh, on those projects that they were given. They were given a number of projects. I don't know the number off the top of my, my head, but we have given them those projects. They have um, been obviously quality assured by us, checked, and are now uh, being brought into service uh, as part of our Greenfields rolling. 
But this might be traversing in a, a slightly more fine-grained way some of the questions Senator Birmingham was asking originally. The corporate plan released in August 2012 shows that NBN Co's network had passed uh, 10,054 lots by 30th of June 2012. They had applications for 133,000. Mr Cooney, you indicated in your opening statement why Greenfields were, were harder than NBN Co anticipated. But did Fujitsu only pass, maybe not connect, but pass 10,000 houses in 12 months, or premises, I should say? So the numbers you're talking about are the Greenfields numbers from the corporate plan, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Page 20 of the corporate plan. So as of August, those numbers would be correct if they're in the corporate plan, the 10,000 lots that were passed by Fujitsu. Obviously, it's increased since then. And we have now brought on these other contractors, as we mentioned. So is there a material difference to the work that Fujitsu has contracted to carry out compared to what Vision Stream and Service Stream are doing? Is that the distinction you're drawing before between Greenfields and Brownfield sites? There, there is a difference. Um, as I said, Fujitsu had more of a contract that they, they were also involved after the installation. They were also putting in what we call our temporary fibre access nodes, which are the actual um, equipment that's, that's put on the estate and needs to be powered and delivered, deliver the services. We're now doing that with um, different contractors because it's more aligned with our Brownfield rollout where we use uh, specialist contractors for different parts of the work. Okay. Um, so is it, is it accurate to say that Fujitsu is, main, is primarily concerned with Greenfield's rollout and isn't going and backfilling older suburban lots? So they are only working on Greenfield's rollout. Was that the question? Yeah. Yes, they are only working on Greenfield. That is the case. Whereas the other two uh, contractors that I named are doing a, a mix. They are doing, yeah, they, they are involved in the, the Brownfields build uh, in, in different regions around the country. Okay, got Stream it. Stream and Service Stream. All right, look, I might have a couple more to put on notice for you, but I'll leave it there and maybe come back a bit later. Thanks, Chair. Senator McDonald. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I, I just uh, have a number of questions that most of them go on notice, but I, I did... Uh, alert Mr Quigley to the fact that I'd be seeking the information here. It returns to the uh, question I've discussed with Mr Quigley over a long period of time, and that's the town of uh, Julia Creek in, in uh, uh, northwestern Queensland, where the uh, trunk line, if I can call it that, fibre passes through the town, but uh, they can't connect to it. Uh, NBN did do an assessment and came up with a figure of $1.4 million to allow the town just to be hooked in. And my letter to Mr Quigley uh, a couple of weeks ago, almost a month ago now, uh, asked that he might let me have the details of how that $1.4 million was calculated on the basis that the community itself is prepared to contribute either money or in kind if we can find out how the $1.4 million is uh, calculated. I, I, I'm not aware of the, the, the correspondence, so, and, uh, and, um, but I'm aware of the, the, um, the work that was done. I haven't got the detail here on how that was costed, but maybe I can refer you, the community and, and yourself, to our network extension projects and policy that we have, where we effectively have a policy in place for those communities that are outside our fibre footprint, that we do have a process in place where that community or individuals, if, it, if, it's, if it's appropriate, can basically make an application to us uh, to, to effectively for us to put a, a, a cost quote together for the uh, build or the, the extension of the fibre network to cover that community or that location. So that would be the process I expect would be, would be possible for Julia Creek to go through and get a, a detailed costing of what it would cost to, to bring the, the, the community into the fibre footprint. That's something we're making available right across the country so that communities can take advantage of what, what possibility they have to raise funds to be able to extend the fibre footprint. Could I just Could clarify something you said, Senator MacDonald? Uh, are you indicating that Julia Creek would be prepared to contribute the incremental costs? Well, depending on what they are, Minister, yes. Um, I mean, they, they're now going to be given a satellite service when the fibre goes right through the centre of town. It's only a little town. I mean, But that's like what, saying... What, there'd only be 100, 100 houses. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Senator McGoran, I'm sure you'd understand this. That's like suggesting that because a freeway goes past every small it town, is. you 
that uh, you should put a an off ramp but, but to but every yes, single yes, it is, town. Yes, it is, Minister, and I know. They all want one. And, and the cost. Yeah, I know, but you uh, don't. No, no one gives everybody one. Sorry, Senator Bush the, be interjected. The cost of the on ramp is yep. big, but what I I've got a figure of 1.4 million, but I want to know if you could tell me what does that involve digging a ditch. Because if so, the council will do it for free, and that might cover, and, and you know, and so forth. If it, re if it so requires putting up a the, pole, I'm aware uh, of the components that were in that particular costing, but uh, certainly there will be. We'll need to put infrastructure in place to house the um, our, our fibre access node. Yes. So we need to have a, yes. a suitable yes. uh, infrastructure with air conditioning, yes. with power, and all the all the necessary elements of that. Uh, for the actual fibering of the town itself, there's obviously for a small community, there's a lot of uh, start-up mobilisation costs yep. that need to be covered, which we don't re recover over such a small number of premises. So those costs would be in addition to what we'd normally expect. Okay, but, but can I go back to my, my, the premise, and I, I'll move on because I know my colleagues have got lots of questions, and I have two, but I'm not going to ask them. I'll put them. But what, what I just want to know mm -hmm. is is how you got to whatever the figure is, if you can list it in a reasonably simple way, and for your box that requires specialist things, perhaps that's $1 million of the 1.4. But that's what we want to know. So they can have a look and make an informed decision, and you can save by giving them a, a satellite dish uh, or something, uh, which the council's willing to look at. They have asked, I have asked, I'm interested to hear Mr McLaren, uh, the information you just, just now give me, I wasn't aware of that. And I must say the council who've been approaching you uh, weren't aware of that. Uh, I did write to indicate that, you know, he was noticed on the 26th of September, so you'd have the information here tonight. I'm sorry that you haven't. Perhaps Mr Quigley has it in his back pocket because it was addressed to him. Uh, but anyhow, if on notice now you could take that and give me that information, and if also you could refer me to the uh, program you're talking about. So the network about. extension policy. Yeah, it's available yeah. on our website, but I'm sure yeah. we can provide I further think, details. I think, to be fair, uh, Senator McDonald, you started asking about Julia Creek before in Bianco had finalised their network, network extension policy. Uh, they were in the process of completing a policy along those lines. Well, uh, but I think you actually predate the policy, and I say that in the kindest possible yes. way. Uh, <laughs> I predate everything. <laughs> no, I, I uh, wasn't going to but, say that, Senator but, McDonald. Uh, but, but be that as it may, uh, I'm just trying to resolve the situation here, and I'd hope we might be able to do it tonight. But uh, if not, can you do it on notice? And uh, you know what you may give us may prove impossible, but the community is very keen to at least have a look at it. They're frustrated that they can't get the sort of answers that you've half given me today. So, so we're making progress. Can, can Thank I, you. Senator McDonald, can I ask, have any of them taken up or, or are they eligible for the satellite at the yes. moment? Yes, they all are, I understand. No, I mean, if they've got 3G presence, they wouldn't be eligible for our satellite. So I was just wondering whether any of them have got our interim, any of the residents, the 100 or so you mentioned, have, have actually connected to the interim satellite service themselves yet. That, that, so I'm just actually interested in that. Well, uh, I, you don't have to give me an answer now if you don't well, know. I'm happy I, to. They have a satellite service. How they've got it, I didn't go into that. Yep. Uh, I, I thought NBN had provided it for uh, a comparative cost. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just not sure whether or not uh, it's an NBN service they've currently got, which I hope it is, uh, or it's uh, one of the oldest satellite well, services. Well, I'll send them the Hansard and they'll be able to. You can let me know. It. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Uh, Sir Bushby. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, the last couple of estimates, you may recall I asked you about the technology used in the MBN trial towns, uh, and you confirmed that it would be replaced by the end of the year at a, a cost then of $1.2 million, uh, and that about 700 boxes would need to be replaced, about 300 midway point, etc. Can you confirm that uh, that is still the case, that there is still an intention to replace those boxes really? with the uh, updated yes. version? Yeah, we're, we're still on track to have that completed by the end of this year. By the end of the we year. started that, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, so we've, we've actually started starting. the switch out, Senator Bushwick. Okay. How many boxes do you anticipate uh, being replaced on a daily basis? I mean, how are you actually approaching it? Do you have... Get me on there. So it's the, the number that we're looking to replace is that 700 you were, yep. you were talking about. Uh, we'll be commencing that over the, the next uh, few weeks. So we have approximately 40, 50 working days. Is that being done by the MBN Co or 
have you got a contractor to oh, do Oh, we're that? definitely working with contractors. Uh, the, the main contractor in Tasmania, as you might be aware, is Vision Street. Yep. Where they are they doing this building the retrofit? network. Uh, I'd need to take it on notice, but my initial uh, thoughts will be it is Vision Street. And uh, we are working with them to, to obviously work with each and every um, end user to make sure the changeover is, is effective and efficient and um, able to be done uh, in a way that obviously takes them to the latest technology. And the total estimated cost of replacing those is still $1.2 million? That's correct. Okay. And there uh, is no scope for, uh, as there is for uh, new um, how, or houses that have passed by to, for people to opt out of having that re replaced? It, it will actually it will have to happen for everybody? I'm just making sure that w yeah. all boxes will be replaced. There's well, no... Most people refuse us access <coughs> to their homes. Yeah. Oh, no, but... Unless they cancel their service. Yeah, that's right. If they cancel their service, then it won't be replaced. We would not need to replace it if there's yeah. no service to be so there may some there is a they potential. They would have to revisit it when they get to the. But it, once the a new service is ordered, turn off. But yeah. uh, I think, and I'm happy for the guys to update if I'm wrong. I think that the copper switch off that we announced doesn't include the original Correct. trial sites, which is the trial sites by definition have the early equipment. So the switch off uh, that we announced just recently of the copper network doesn't include them in the short term. Right. So they're not faced with that imminent choice. When I say imminent, we're still 20 months away from the imminent choice. Uh, but they're not included in that first trial of the switch-off phase because of this issue. OK. Um, now, in answer to a question on notice 350 uh, from the May estimate, I asked some questions in, uh, on that question about um, the second round of uh, construction in Tasmania. And in one of them, you indicated that the, uh, the value of the work that had been performed by Lend Lease uh, was approximately $27.9 million. And then you go on to say that the works to be performed by Vision Stream in South Hobart will be performed under the detailed design construction, etc., and that the value of that contract with Vision Stream is approximately $300 million. Now, that $300 million seems like a lot for South Hobart, which is the way it reads, but I presume that's not the case. Yeah, that's not that's South for, Hobart is a broader South, area than South Hobart. That's for all of Tasmania. That's what I presumed was probably <laughs> the case, but I just wanted to clarify that. It just The way it reads, it sounds like you're talking about South Hobart and then $300 million. Is there Tasmania North I grew up in northern Tasmania, so... Senator Rebets don't say word. Yeah, that's right. We have no Tasmanian splits here, OK? Um, what kind of handover has there been between Lend Lease Infrastructure and Vision Stream? How has that handover actually occurred? Uh, these are very separate projects. Uh, different towns obviously have been involved for, for one contractor and different towns for the other contractor. So we've been dealing with both contractors for those particular projects. Uh, there hasn't had to be a handover as such because Lend Lease have completed the work on their towns yep. and, and we've brought them into service. They're the ones like Triobunas and Helens and, and the like. And um, Vision Stream are now working on our new projects, the new Brownfield FSAMs in that area. So there's, there's no real need to, to have a handover between the companies. Obviously, we deal with each company, bring them up to speed, bring them on, on board them in terms of how we need them to work and so on. Um, so uh, there's uh, obviously continuity in, in how they work with us and our systems and, and the like. OK. Um, the Vision Stream uh, rollout, are they um, working with Aurora in terms of the use of their poles to actually roll out the, the infrastructure? Uh, I believe so, where necessary, obviously. Uh, where we're using Aurora's infrastructure, then we will have uh, Vision Stream as the contractor on the ground working with Aurora, yes. And has the relationship with Aurora gone smoothly? I mean, are they allowing Vision Stream access to their infrastructure? Has there been any issues in terms of gaining that access? Well, I think we've moved to Telstra with the new parts of the build, there might be some parts. But where, where there's no Telstra, where t Telstra in many cases are using Aurora infrastructure for the copper network. So we have to you still use aerial builds and in those situations we'll be working with Aurora. And we are, and I'm pretty sure we are having Vision Stream working with Aurora, um, have, activating there's, customers. There have been no issues with Aurora in that respect? And uh, are, are they put any uh, requirements that um, Aurora has, yeah, they have to have Aurora workers with them uh, when you're accessing their 
uh, their infrastructure? As I understand, Vision Stream have been going through a induction program, working with Aurora, getting all the necessary accreditation so that they can work on the, the Aurora infrastructure. And I personally am not aware of, of any problems that have been happening with that uh, relationship. OK, now I'm aware of the time, so I'll move on to an, the next one. Um, OK, this is just uh, just update. In, uh, you indicated on uh, uh, question on notice uh, number 340 from February estimates that there, as at 6th of April, there were seven, and you've gone through the overall Australian figures, but in Tasmania, you indicated as in April, there were 702 premises that had ordered the services, 3,987 premises were passed in the first three Tasmanian sites, uh, and you also gave some figures on uh, the take-up rate. Can you update those figures for Tasmania uh, as at the most recent um, so, audit? So what was that question? Well, sorry, what I'd like to know is uh, how many Tasmanian homes and businesses have now signed up to the MBN in Tasmania? How many homes and businesses? Uh, I think the recollection is over a thousand on all the platforms. Uh, I was just down there, so I got an update. So I think there's over a thousand on the platforms. Uh, we're ahead of take-up rate is ahead of our forecast in every site in Tasmania. Uh, we forecast 11 to 12 per cent, and uh, the average across Tasmania, I think, from recollection, is about 17 or 18 per cent, with midway point up in the high 20s. Yeah, the midway uh, point was 27 per cent. Yeah, so, I think it's uh, still so roughly around in, in there. So I'm interested in where it is now, what the, yep. the take-up rate is for each of the sites. Um, and I'm, oh, I'd have to you, take, yeah, I'd have have to take, take that on notice, notice for that's you. fine. But, uh, um, the, so the, the three trial but sites, but also the new sites. Kingston Beach. Yeah, Kingston, Kingston Beach, Beach is one of the second round yeah, ones. We've, uh, I think, uh, in the three months since we opened in Kingston Beach, it's 17% it's take up in the first three months yeah. in Kingston Beach. And it may well have been higher if uh, uh, people who wanted to sign up could actually get on, and it's another issue I'll get to if I have time. But, um, there's been but I thought you were opposed to anyone signing up to it. No. No, I'm, what we're opposed to is government waste. But if the, if the thing's there, sorry, what you're opposed to is government waste. Oh, government waste. Government okay. waste. Okay. So spending the fibre to the node it. network, which would have to be replaced in a few years, wouldn't be waste then. A bigger part. A fibre to the node network that needed to be replaced no. yeah, look, within look, a couple of years after it's finished places, being built. Just ring the yeah. governor general. Look, um, <laughs> that's a good line, Eric. I like that. Can you also, when you take on those, just assign, how many new customers have signed up to the MBN in Tasmania in the last 12 months? Uh, how are business take-ups going in Tasmania? I don't know that we break them out. <coughs> I, I, it may be possible. I mean, we, I don't think we could reveal the names, but I, I don't know we've ever broken them out internally in the stats between it's, it's homes and businesses. Obviously, with retail service providers yeah. operating at the retail level, we don't have we just full visibility of. Of you just keep the service. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not aware of all of, uh, of how the business packages are going in Tasmania at all? Oh, look, I can, give you, uh, I can give you a quote from a uh, business in uh, Kingston Beach that I, uh, that I just visited. Uh, let me uh, give you the exact quote. I've got it here. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, Wafu, I think, uh, who said that... Uh, it was an, she'd encourage other people to take it up. So uh, who, who did? Who did? What's it? Uh, I'll give you the. Sense? If you bear with me for a second, who I'm sure someone. Provider? Did they buy their package off? Uh, Primus. Primus. Because uh, uh, the the individuals from Primus, I'm sure I'll I'll have that exact quote for you very shortly. Somebody uh, in your office will be sending it to you. Also, we just to make sure we completely uh, completely across uh, the NBN Co haven't released most of, Jim, you'll have to help me here, most of their business packages. But uh, Mr Hassel will give you an update in a second. Uh, Jan Ochi explained that not only had the NBN helped her small business to connect better with online customers, but helped to save valuable time and improve the efficiency of the business. The speed and reliability that an NBN connection promised was just too tempting not to try out and probably the main reason that we were early adopters, said Ms Ochi. Uh, Jan, her name, also encouraged other businesses to take up the opportunity to be a part of the future of the internet and said the benefits were endless. The NBN, this is, this is her quotes in a newspaper. The NBN is so reliable. I'll tell you the newspaper in a second. The NBN is so reliable, I'm now able to spend more time putting my focus where it should be, my customers, and I'm thrilled with the service. And this was in 
the Kingsborough Chronicle on page one yesterday. King Road. Yeah. So, and in terms of business know. packages, Mr. Hassel? No. So I know you asked about business yeah. packages. So, yeah, so the, so the business packages, we've just released our um, business products in the last month or so, which is aimed at the small business market. But I think, as um, uh, Gary McLaren just mentioned, there are a lot of businesses which have just taken up the normal products exactly. as they That's are. Where I was going. And I we don't. That business is one of them. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we don't actually have that detail because uh, of which are businesses and which are consumer. They just order them through an RSP. The service provider would know that, which were the business and which were the consumer, but we don't actually see the um, numbers on either of those. Okay, I've, I've been approached by a number of businesses that have been trying to get a business package through the MBN and have had great trouble in actually uh, getting well, anything that even looks the like The MBN doesn't offer business packages to no, individual well, they've customers. Been, they've, been, they've been approaching might the explain service that. providers and uh, they haven't been able to. They've, they've, uh, even one business in Surreal which was approached by a the MBN Co, or was encouraged by the MBN Co to take it up and tried, spent many months, still haven't managed to get a, uh, a package that works. If you'd, like to, if you'd like to put them in touch with us, uh, with my office, I'm sure we can assist them. Well, I may well do that. No, please do. I'd, I'd happily, uh, and, uh, happily and assist them. I think them. Senator Betts has been approached by people in, in uh, businesses as well, and uh, Senator Colbeck's also had uh, approaches in I, North Western Tasmania. I will be happy to help every single one of them, I promise you. Yeah, well, it's, you, well, if you, you want to, I'm not asking you. Get, I'm yes. not asking you to give you the names in public. I'm happy for yeah, you yeah. to help, pass help, one help off. And we will see what we can do to help every one of them. Yeah. Enjoy well, the experience of the. In MBN. the interest of others asking, I've got some more stuff I'll put on notice, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Senator Betts. Look, if I may, just following on from Senator Bushby, I've had a number of businesses, from doctor surgeries to uh, a. Uh, um, family company running a fishing business unable to connect to the NBN. So NBN doesn't provide the package, you're saying? No, NBN's a wholesaler to yeah. retail customer, to so, retail RSPs, R being the retail. So why doesn't NBN tell these people their range of options that NBN can't help them, but they should be going elsewhere for help? Or so that they NBN, can get connected. Well, NBN aren't in a position they can promote any individual. We have an agreement where, and legislation that uh, doesn't allow us to promote individual RSPs. We can provide some information when, and guys might mm -hmm. want to jump in. Yeah, but, but they should say what? it is possible to connect, and the way to do it is. Yeah, one, one of the things we, we try and make sure people understand, both businesses and consumers in the area, the process they need to go through to connect to the MBN, uh, and that, that requires them to go through to a retail service provider, a, a Primus or a Telstra or an Optus, uh, and then order the service, and we, and we wholesale. Yeah, but see, why doesn't the... You know, they rang the NBN company, these people are telling me, and they're just told, sorry, we don't provide it, full stop, as though it is impossible. And we're getting that from a doctor's surgery, a fishing business, and uh, others. Mm. And so it seems as though it's not a one-off. And whilst I understand NBN cannot say, sign up with Group A, surely they Thanks. can say, it is possible for you to sign up. Yes. And the way to go about it, or just have a look on such and such a website, and there you've got a range of the RSPs. And I don't, I don't know the, the details of the individual conversation, but that's exactly the conversation that we have at a call centre or at a, at a contact centre level. But what it may have been, and, I, and I'm hazarding a guess here, is that if they're asking about a specific business product, maybe what, and this was before the time it was launched, there may have been some confusion around there, but well, we have a very this clear is process. This 10th of September. Mm, oh, so about, about a, month. a month ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah about we launched them about a month ago. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, oh, we're, but we, we're genuinely happy if you'd like to pass our names on to myself and yes. Mr. Kearney, we will happily. Oh, well, without happily, going through your office. No, no, I'm happy for you to pass can, it to Mr. No, 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 no. Without going through your office, can you give us on notice, as a matter of some urgency, what website they should be looking sure. at or what facility they can. Um, uh, in the first instance, what I'd encourage them to do is to visit our website, mbnco.com.au, and in there it'll, there'll, there's a section in terms of the process you go through, also instructional videos, uh, and a sense of what the process is that, as an end consumer, I'd go through how I would choose an RSP and what that so if they steps would be. Get onto your website, it all will be revealed. That's right. All right. Then, look, if I may, just quickly turn to another matter which 
uh, arrays at Kingston Beach, and seeing that you're a reader of all things Kingston Beach, Minister, I'm sure you're aware of the letter to the editor on the Monday on of Monday the 15th of October 2012 from a Mr R I'm, Roger I Tong tragically in stuck Kingston in Beach. Uh, now, this relates to the decommissioning of the old copper wire system and the house alarm systems. Back to base. Yeah, back to base, that the optic fibre doesn't provide. And so they are, they are now going to have, in effect, obsolete alarm systems. One, has this issue been raised with you before? Yeah, no, we've been. And if it, ha if it has, we're what is the answer? Yeah, we're in correspondence with, uh, the, I think, one of the uh, groups that uh, looks after emergency services. There are currently three retail service providers supporting what is called the UniV, and think of V as voice, uh, services and thus analogue medical alarms on the NBN. So there are three providers currently on the NBN. Well, what about that support and burglar alarms as opposed oh, to we're talk, I'm talking alarms. about, well, I, are the same. Yeah, they're, the technology the same should be principally the same. Right. So I, I'm not trying to be tricky, but I, I think that point it just is happens right. naturally. We Telstra know. has advised my office that they will also support medical alarm functionality. Internode, Ionote, AAPT, and Primus are also capable of doing so, but have yet to release a commercial product. Well, uh, there is that's just, no. But to give you, no, no, if I can just finish, to yeah. give you. A functioning example today, so you understand that it can be done. There is an aged care facility in Mornington, Victoria, that is connected to the MBN with fully functioning medical alarms. Uh, analog alarms work today, as I said, on the UniV. Uh, that's the voice port, as we call it. Uh, this traffic is prioritised TC1. That's a technical term. I'm sure Mr McLaren could explain if you want mm. to know. And is supported by the battery backup. In the near future, Digital or internet protocol based alarms will be supported on the NBN as well. Although these well, devices oh, work. All right, look. No, will this these, is, will this is actually issues, no, will relevant the, information. Time is very short. Will these issues be resolved for before these customers switched off? Yeah. before the switch off? Yes. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, um, Sir McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be um, quick. I have an issue at the Napoleons uh, in Victoria, which I'm sure you're aware of. But prior to that, I'm wondering if on notice you could actually outline the process that NBN has to consult with communities in regional areas with respect to the corresponding need for NBN towers and also outline the consultation processes you've taken in regional communities within Victoria specifically in terms of the process, but also who, where, what, when and how. Um, and also uh, requirements for tendering around the building of new NBN towers in regional areas. How many applications on behalf of the NBN have been made for new NBN towers in regional Victoria? That's an actual question. So for the actual number in Victoria, yes. I'll have to take that on notice and go away and... Okay, and, and could you uh, also, if you're taking that on notice, could you also um, provide the status for each of those um, applications? To where the they're best at. there of our, of our ability, but just back to the community consultation. Did you? No, I take that on notice. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it'll be a process that you right. can outline for me, mm -hmm. um, with some details. But on the Napoleons, um, my question goes to um, a comment Mr. Quigley made uh, when one of the nine applications for towers was rejected. And I'm going to um, what the councillors have actually said, that the NBN proposal for the Napoleons did not meet the code of practice for telecommunications facilities in Victoria. And one of the towers was rejected by council. The other eight were approved. And as a consequence, Mr Quigley then says, uh, the company will provide residents with broadband eventually, but it's most likely going to be a slower satellite service and not available for several years. I've got advice from the council that there were other sites within the area that could have um, assisted the council in making a, a different decision around the approval of that particular tower. Um, however, and that goes back to my conversations, uh, questions around consultation 
Could you just outline where this is at and, and your response, I guess, to these my, my comments? My understanding is that there was one other potential site, but it required approval and agreement of the landowner, who initially indicated they may be willing and then subsequently withdrew. Uh, the trick about, and Mr McLaren can take you into excruciating detail, the trick about fixed wireless is it requires line of sight. It isn't possible just to say, move it 50 metres over that way and have everything work the same way. But I'm sure Mr McLaren would love to uh, give us some uh, extensive details on the way mm -hmm. So in each community, works. we do go through a number of I what we call... I wireless works, Minister. No, no, I guess fixed, this no, is no, about this specific no, no. issue I want to no, know no, for the no, let's be very Ballarat clear. people. Let's sure. be very clear. Fixed wireless is not the same as mobile, and it is important to understand the line of sight issues involved in the NBN fixed wireless towers. As to Correct. the issue of Napoleon, as Mr Quigley has indicated, as they've rejected the tower, as there is no One more suitable nine. sites, yeah, as there is no more suitable sites, uh, they've, the NBN have moved on. We're not going to force uh, towers on the community. And the citizens, I think, was it Mr Quigley wrote or I wrote? I'm just trying to remember which it was. Mr Quigley wrote to the residents in the area and said, uh, as the tower's been rejected, uh, NBN satellite services will become available when the two satellites are launched in 2015 and uh, they'll be able to take advantage of the satellite service. And is there, uh, given this was the first such rejection in Australia um, by, by a council, can you see, given issues around mobile t phone towers, etc., and uh, for amenity reasons, wind... Uh, generators, etc. Does the NBN foresee this being an increasing issue as it rolls out into uh, we, regional areas? We're consulting with the community all across Australia. We've had a number of towers and other uh, jurisdictions, I think, knocked back. Uh, and we are working on the basis that if communities say no, I don't think we've appealed any. I think we've indicated... I think we've indicated we might appeal one there may particular be some situations one. Situations yeah. where we do take it yeah. to the next stage of the planning process, which through a, through a tribunal. But, Can but, I just ask what would be the criteria yeah. of you deciding to take it now, to that, a tribunal? Um, that didn't warrant this town. So that's a good Polly. question. And can you just take that on notice? Because I'm conscious there's other people that want to okay. ask questions. Thank you very much. Bemo, it's yours. Birmingham. Thanks. Sorry, um, did we just stop that question, answer? Sorry, whatever. It's done. Bermo's got the call. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you got your answer? No, no. Yes, okay. It's all I'm not sure you're all right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was distracted. Stage. Was there someone trying to answer? No. no, no I'm happy no. to answer that question. No, well, it's okay. I'm, I'll take it on notice. No, okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you. Can I just turn to um, um, evidence given, I think, at the start of the hearing? in terms of the number of premises connected to fibre and the number of premises connected to Sorry, the Connected NBN. or passed? Because we were talking about passed at the beginning of the committee. Sorry, Minister? Uh, we were talking about homes passed rather than connected. Yes, yes, I, I, I know. So yep, 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 but I, I think in Mr Cooney's opening statement, if I have a recollection or somewhere in some of the information given early on, um, was a statement given as to the number of connections achieved thus far uh, and was that 24,000? 24,000, I think 24, you said. 24,000, yes. 24,000, there we go. Hearing correctly. Excellent. Um, of those 24,000, how many are uh, for fibre services? Uh, how many for satellite services? Sure. I'm told it's uh, 25,496 today, is the latest figure. They are breaking news. So for the 24,000, um, just under 6,400 are fibre, um, just under 600 are fixed wireless, and uh, just over 17,000 are for satellite. Okay. So the vast majority of, of that 24,000, 17,000 are for satellite. 25,500 today. 25,496 today, Minister. I, I heard that as well. Mr Hassel just gave us a breakdown for the 24,000 if he wants to be... It's growing fast, isn't it? It's got if a he up. wants to be more specific, then he can be. Um, how many of uh, the... Well, 
rephrase that question because I don't want the Minister to accuse me of misleading or, uh, or providing leading questions or putting words in anybody's mouth. Um, have the customers who were uh, participants of the satellite services provided under the Australian Broadband Guarantee been moved over to NBN services? I think the, uh, you have to, it was for new customers first, there were sort of two categories. Mm -hmm. uh, new customers first, and if you'd had an ABG service, if I could characterise them in that way, uh, you had to have had it for three years mm -hmm. before you could switch into the new service. Those are the rules we announced at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So there were a, a group of um, um, three-year ABG yeah. veterans. If you're, trying to, if you're trying to find out whether these are new customers or old customers that we're claiming and churning, uh, I get the line. Uh, I'm not sure we have that information. If that's where you're going, I'm not sure where we've got that information, just to save time. No, uh, nobody in the department potentially has that information who would have had knowledge of ABG customers? No. I'm not saying we couldn't get it. I'm just saying I don't think we would... Uh, I've never... I've never sought that information myself, so I, that's why I understood where you were going. Uh, but uh, we may have it handy, or we may not. I'm not sure. Um, we've got yeah. some broad numbers. We can talk. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Hazlitt. Mark Hazlitt, Acting First Assistant Secretary, yeah. Telecommunications. Um, the numbers I have are not actually um, actual connections, but they're closely related to it. So I'll give you so broad that, so round of, applications. Um, they're more registration. Registration, yes. Yeah. Um, People will phone up and register. Yeah. That's how the process works. Yeah. So, uh, so, 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 so if anything, it would over. They include no. active yeah, and pending. pending. This includes active, active and, and pending. pending. Active and pending. Active so and the breakup is broadly out of seventeen thousand. Um, Eight thousand would be um, essentially new customers, and nine thousand. Are in a category that mainly includes previous ABG customers of more than three years standing. Thank you. So, approximately 9,000 of the uh, 17,000 uh, satellite customers for NBN Co um, are previous ABG customers of more than three years standing. But j just so we're clear, this is demand driven. People contact us if they want the service to see if they're eligible and if they're eligible they can then register. Uh, so it's, it's not that their department are contacting people when, and asking them. When, when, when did the ABG program end? Uh, the, effectively, there are still months, people just over 12 months ago. But there are still people under contract. Mm -hmm. to a, yes. Under ABG that, that, contracts. That, that, they had a fixed period of time. Yeah, who are not eligible. These people their three-year ABG contracts have expired. But addition of new recipients ended 12 months ago. The good news and is they're getting a people, much better service. And people are continually much better service, ending faster, their ABG bigger download caps, services. And it's actually yes. reliable this time. So. And, and how many ABG customers um, in total uh, uh, would qualify? Um, I don't have that number to hand. We can take, take that on notice. Happy to take that on notice. If you, uh, if you could take that on notice, that'd be great. And just for the record, all, all the previous fibre customers also use, all the new fibre customers used to be copper customers too. Thanks. Uh, just thought uh, I'd help. Thank, thanks, Minister, for, uh, uh, for, for that little throwaway piece of, uh, of information That's there. Factual, factual information. Uh, so has the department provided information to ABG customers about how they might register and migrate to NBN Co? Uh, we have not actively sought to communicate to all ABG customers. That's a matter for the service providers involved. So okay. we're, not, and we're not generating it. Yeah. It's happening by word of mouth. Well, Because people well, really well, like well, the well, service. Well, word of mouth or um, the service providers involved presumably obviously have an incentive as retail service providers to not, migrate not, their customers. No, the, the, the incentive under the old program was for them just to grab customers and put them on. Uh, the incentives under this program are very different. How many customers um, uh, of the 24,000 have, uh, have migrated uh, as a result of uh, agreements with Optus? Uh, sorry, are we talking about fibre customers, wireless customers? No, that's a different number. It's got to be 
No, he asked 24,000, so that includes all three platforms. Uh, 24,000 so includes just, all three platforms, so how many, an open question. I'm not sure that that information no, no, is so publicly do, available. I don't, do uh, I don't think NBN would be in a position to release that. Uh, it's a commercially a commercial arrangement between NBN Co and Optus, and I'm not sure Optus would give us permission to release that number. If Optus want to release it themselves or give us permission, we'd be happy to, but I'm not sure that we'd be in a position that we could release that figure. Is it tens, hundreds, thousands? I, as I said, I don't know the breakdown. I get, obviously, I get well, the, uh, the numbers, uh, well, but I don't have a breakdown. Obviously, there's 24,000 connections have been claimed. Now, when we've unpacked that Sorry, a bit, we claimed. find out that... Did you say being claimed? No, we have active... Okay. There are 24,000 active connections. Um, 25,500, as I said now. Thank you, Minister. Uh, there are... Um, I'm, I'm pleased... It grows every day. What can I say? We, it's popular. Yes, thank you, Minister. People want um, a better broadband service. Mr Cooney gave a statement that there were 24,000 um, active connections. Um, that's been broken down, to which we understand um, 17,000 of those are actually satellite connections, of which, in fact, 9,000 of those have migrated from the ABG. Um, so uh, 24,000 connections is 15,000 new connections and 9,000 transferees from ABG. Um, but then there's also an unknown number uh, that can't be revealed or won't be revealed who have migrated from Optus. Uh, migrated in the, in the satellite sense or in the fibre sense? I'm just trying to find out whether you're trying to ask about Optus satellite customers, and I don't know if there were any to migrate, so I, yeah. I don't know. No, 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 I'm... But if you're asking how many Optus customers have migrated on the fibre, as I said, I'm not sure that we could reveal that information. I'm happy to take it on notice and see if there's any information that we can give you on that. But it, it wouldn't be any different if you said Telstra or Primus or any of the others. I'm not sure I'd be in a position to reveal that because I think that would be potentially commercially sensitive to the company, not in the end, to but, the company. But, but, but Minister, isn't it possible that of, of your quoted figure, potentially half or even more are either customers who, um, as a result of a deal with Optus, have been brought across to the NBN um, or indeed have come across to the NBN um, <laughs> from a program that was initially set up under the Howard government? Uh, great conspiracy theory, I admire you. It's not a conspiracy uh, no, theory. No, it's a, you're, you're now it, trying it, to, it, it, you're now trying to pretend how you're take up, your numbers. You're now trying to pretend the take up is artificially inflated by the companies uh, forcing them across. So, I love well, it. Here we go again, it. here we go again. You know, uh, both of you continually try and talk over each other. I'd really like you to try and calm down and we might get some information one way or the other. And you've got another five no, minutes. Clarify, just for information, are you asking whether they've migrated from the HFC or they've migrated from the copper? It's, well, it's I, germane to your question. Well, I'm not well, trying to be careful, but it's germane to your question. Well, well I'm interested in any, although um, obviously I would have thought the HFC okay. is where the um, deal is more likely to have existed or indeed off of the Optus satellite. Yeah, look, I, Where I don't know that be. we've actually turned there, on, and Gary and the guys have might there help been me. migrations no, no, from the Optus all, satellite? No, no, but this, I don't think Optus have a satellite service. Uh, they're the wholesaler. I'm not sure they provide a retail service. Where, where, here, where, here's okay, the where, where Optus is I'm the I'm not sure that we've turned on the NBN yet anywhere where Optus has rolled out the HFC. Now, I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it might be a so very Brunswick, small Brunswick, footprint. Brunswick, okay. Possibly but, Brunswick. No, but where the Optus got impounded when they took the trucks there. <laughs> okay. uh, so they may not have actually rolled what, out <laughs> much HFC in Brunswick. That's my what, point. What, what, what about migration but, of satellite services where Optus was the wholesaler? Has there been any uh, incentive provided God. for people to no, migrate? not that I'm aware of. No. Peter, help me here. No. I don't think so. No. So now your conspiracy theory that we've got this incentive to blow the for a blowout in numbers is failing on basic premises. Well, 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 Minister, at the very least... No we, pun intended. At, at, at the very least, Minister, we're very clear that, uh, uh, that your, your 24,000 is propped up by 9,000 oh, ABG transfers. Up. 
You are priceless. Well, well it's pretty you significant, Minister. $9,000. It's growing a thousand, dollar, a thousand in a week again. Uh, and you're having to try and pretend that we're inflating the numbers artificially. It's pathetic. Oh, please, Minister. It's pathetic. It's not pathetic. What's Seriously. What's, what's pathetic are the grand boasts you continue to make about something that's running so far behind schedule and over budget. Oh, dear. Just keep repeating the so same words over and of, over again. Speaking of over budget, can I go to um, indirect expenses within the corporate plan? How would we characterise uh, indirect uh, OPEX? Is that largely employee salaries, consulting, legal costs, corporate travel, IT, rent, office space, advertising, those sorts of things? Uh, one moment, let me find this. Sorry? Sorry, okay. can I just let you know? This is the one where something got shifted out of one column into another column. And just while you're working through that, can I just, seeing as the chair invited me to do this previously on a different matter, um, um, it's nice to have the three gentlemen here tonight. Uh, I'm curious though, where's uh, Mr. Steffens? Okay, sorry, well, sorry, Senator. Sorry, you were asking. Sorry, I just, uh, just took the opportunity, although I, I, I didn't think it had worked the first time, which is why I didn't do it then and it didn't work this time, even <laughs> though I tried uh, to ask a question while you were consulting that uh, was unrelated. Um, which about was about Ralph Stephens, is that <laughs> yes? Yes. Um, so we took, in terms of why he's not here tonight. Mm. Um, so we took uh, our best estimate of who would be most appropriate here. We looked at previous questions, and from our estimation, they were often about either the technology, as, as Gary has mentioned tonight, or the communications or the community engagement, as it was touched on from Senator McKenzie, or often around the pricing um, in the product makeup. So we we thought this would be the, the most appropriate makeup. But if there are other executives that no, you would like to see, so, so Mr. Stephens is still the, the chief operating officer. And... Yes. Okay. So, uh, now, sorry, you were um, answering as to uh, oh, what indirect opex uh, is. I can just sorry one, one moment. Sorry. And just, just to assist me in terms of uh, Senator Birmingham, where, where, whereabouts were you referring to it in the, in the corporate plan? Well, uh, well, I was actually just ensuring that I, I had an appreciation uh, that in the corporate plan, when it refers to, uh, uh, to indirect OPEX, that it's referring to things like um, um, employee salaries, change, consulting, legal costs. My recollection is that there was a change in the items that were characterised. Uh, we're just, I'm just trying to get some information dug up for him because I yes. know where you're going. Uh, but there was a change in the characterisation uh, of what was direct versus indirect expenses, uh, which I think you guys uh, tried to create as some blowout in expenses. When in actual fact, all that happened there was a change in categorisation. But I will get you some more information shortly. Thanks, uh, thanks, Minister. So there's no disputing the fact that the original corporate plan indicated uh, $3.7 billion of indirect As expenses I said, between there was a change 20... in what gets characterised. What... There was a change Chair. in classification. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I... Senator Can I finish a sentence, please? Actually talk. Senator Conroy, you know my position on this. I was a bit distracted. I didn't notice that it was uh, getting to that stage. So, Senator Birmingham, you, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wanting to check. There's no dispute that uh, you can answer, of course, Minister, when you get the information as to how definitions may have changed. But in terms of how information is presented in the corporate plan, there's no dispute that uh, the original corporate plan indicated $3.7 billion of indirect expenses. The revised corporate plan indicating something in the order of $7.9 billion over the same 11-year period. Those figures are an accurate reflection uh, are they of what was in the two corporate plans? OK. Uh, uh, as I said, because we're a number of months after you first, the opposition first made these claims, yes. we're very aware of the claim uh, which was made that MBNCO's budget for primarily mm -hmm. staff costs uh, has more than doubled, and that was a press release from Mr Turnbull. Uh, it's just false. 
Uh, as you'd well know, indirect OPEX includes more than just staff costs, it includes IT costs and other costs. Increases in indirect OPEX include provision for additional IT systems to ensure effective operational systems are in place. Resources directed towards public interest services such as the TUSMA levies and a recategorisation of operating and maintenance expenditure from direct OPEX to indirect OPEX. This results in the direct OPEX being lower in the current plan than it was in the 2010 corporate plan, which you miraculously don't mention when you try and claim this blowout. The additional OPEX is also in part due to increased resources at MBNCO for public information campaigns, something you personally supported in the Joint Parliamentary Committee, as did Mr Turnbull. Uh, and let's not forget that that was your recommendation. So, uh, and MBNCO has done just that. Uh, thanks, uh, so, Senator Birmingham. Chair, 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 I have been just to save time. Well, well, Senator Birmingham, I have been very, very generous. No, no, I have been very generous. I indicated to you some time ago that yes. I needed some time. And I've sat here very the government, while the government the has not long had answers. A order. The government, ha you know, you've got a terrible habit of trying to speak over people. You should just Thank stop it. Thank you for the manners lesson, Chair. You should just stop it. Um, I indicated that I would be seeking the call myself at 10.30. We've gone past 10.30. I've got the call. And I'd like one question um, to try to wrap up this line of questioning, Chair. That's all well, I've Well, you've had for. all night to do it. Um, <laughs> now, I've got, uh, some, I've got some questions in relation to a, uh, an article by Paul Fletcher in The Australian on... Let's see what the date was. October the 3rd, 2012. It says, Kiwis show how to roll out a broadband network. Is, are you aware of this article? Yes. Yeah. Makes a number of claims in the article. It says, to start with, the Kiwis have got the right mix of public and private sector roles. But there's a s massive role for the private sector in Australia's NBN, isn't there? Um, absolutely, as was as was being talked about before, and in the various contractors that we use, Vision Stream, Service Stream, um, that they are all private organisations, and they are a key part of this rollout on the ground. And Mr. Fletcher goes on to say that uh, with their own money, and he's talking about contractors in New Zealand, with their own money at risk, these four companies have strong incentives to build their networks quickly and the incentives are reinforced by competition between the four companies to win the rollout race. Um, now, what's the incentive for NBN contractors um, to build the network quickly? So uh, we, we, we drive them on performance-based targets, um, so they are only paid when they perform. Also, if I understand the New Zealand model, having come recently from New Zealand, um, the construction areas are by and large mutually exclusive geographically, so the race is in a, are in different areas, it's a, it's um, rather than you're competing for a, for a, for a, um, for, for a greater land mass, you're, gi you're given a geographic area and you roll out within there. So we, we uh, create the same incentives, sounds very similar, whereby we, a lot of our construction partners, all of our construction partners, uh, only uh, are able to receive ongoing work and, and bonuses as they perform. Mm. And the other statement that Mr Fletcher makes is that um, the negotiations with these companies meant that essentially they're each getting an interest-free loan with payments under the loan linked to milestones. Um, so, and when I was in New Zealand two weeks ago uh, with the NBN committee, uh, I was advised that the government was looking to, at least, to, to get a return, to basically get their money back. Mm. So what is the difference between getting your money back and what, what will happen with NBN? Um, for government funding. My, my observation would be that with the MBN, it's not an interest free loan, is that we are returning an internal rate of return of 7% to the Australian public. So it's an investment rather than a loan. Okay. Um, now I want to go to some of the, the issues that Mr. Fletcher actually didn't mention in his article. Uh, in discussions, with Chorus, are you aware of the company Chorus? Yes. 
Uh, they are a former arm of Te Telstra New Zealand. Telecom New Zealand. Telecom New Zealand. And they are um, one of the major rollout companies in the metropolitan areas. That's correct. They took us to a site visit in a suburb called Churton Park, C-H-U-R-T-O-N Park. I'm not, I don't know if anyone is aware of that suburb. Mm -hmm. It's in Wellington. Um, what they showed us in this site visit was that there were three rollouts of fibre. No, no, three rollouts for... Um, uh, one for pay TV, which was uh, a rollout that was done previously, and some people were using it to get their uh, internet services as well. Mm -hmm. There was an ADSL rollout, which was done through what they describe as cabinetization. cabinetization. You're aware of that? Yeah. And then there was a third rollout, which was fibre to the cabinet, and that um, fibre uh, was not connected anywhere but to the cabinet. It was simply rolled out. So there was three different connections in this one street that they showed us. Um, this, is, this type of overbuild is being avoided in Australia, isn't it? Uh, that's exactly right. It's a, a single nationwide uh, telecommunications infrastructure that is not only a wholesale network but it's an open access wholesale network um, is exactly what's being built here to avoid uh, the over 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 building in, in infrastructure and instead there is a single nationwide as I mentioned um, so that's exactly what we're trying to avoid yeah. I mean look uh, Senator Cameron I might be able to add as you know I recently had a joint press conference with the uh, the New Zealand communications minister a member of the Conservatives uh, political party uh, over in New Zealand. And she was actually asked about her rollout. Uh, and she was asked why her government was to go, wanted to go down the path of a fibre network uh, to deliver high-speed broadband. And this is her exact quote. The most comprehensive and future-proof network we could build was a fibre to the home package. Effectively, it made far better fiscal sense and all the feedback we've had is it's been the right way to go. And she went on to say it made better sense to do it now rather than having to come back in the future and retrofit a fibre to the node to a fibre to the home connection. So the Australian government, as you know, Senator Cameron, went down the path of looking at a fibre to the node network. We held a tender for it. We had an expert committee with some of Australia's preeminent technology finance and regulatory experts. And they came back to us and said, we actually recommend that if you want to do the future-proof uh, operation, go fibre to the home. Don't put your money into fibre to the node. And my New Zealand counterparts, after looking at the evidence, looking at the lack of performance that, and I think you would have experienced some of that firsthand yourself. It's a pity Senator Birmingham wasn't able to go to New Zealand with you. Uh, that uh, the quality of the broadband being delivered on the fibre to the node network was far less than had been claimed by its proponents. And that's exactly why New Zealand decided not to waste taxpayers' money by building a fibre to the node network when they knew they would ultimately have to come back and retrofit it fibre to the home. And that's exactly the same call that we made a year or two earlier than the New Zealand decision. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I, I'm very pleased the committee, I want to congratulate the committee for taking the initiative of going to New Zealand. Uh, it's a pity Mr Turnbull didn't go. I, I think Senator Birmingham, you probably were genuinely uh, not able to go, you were a bit busy at the time, uh, but I think it really would have enhanced your understanding. So I urge you to look at the uh, transcripts uh, and, uh, and learn from what the New Zealand Conservative government decided to do, which was to future-proof the country with the best possible future-proof technology of fibre to the home.
Yeah, that's, that's right, Senator uh, Conroy. They went through this process of cabinetisation. And what I was interested in, because there is a proposal to run a cabinet fibre to the node proposition in Australia, but what they discovered in New Zealand when they, they rolled it out was they had to build special cabinets. The cabinets had to have generators uh, available for power cuts. The cabinets had to be soundproofed and insulated. Uh, the cabinets uh, had to, uh, as I said, have generators there if, if there was power cuts. Otherwise, all of the communications went down. And they also indicated that they could not, in New Zealand, continue uh, to deal with the old copper network because of the deterioration of the copper network. Can you, this issue of the uh, using copper from a fibre to the node and then copper, what would be involved in the cabinets? To, would it be a similar proposition as in New Zealand where you have to have specialised cabinets with power to the cabinet insulation in the cabinet, fans in the cabinet. It, the cabinet looked at actually quite a, a technological feat and they actually indicated that they were. Mm -hmm. no, essentially, you're right. I, I'd add there's also batteries, lead-acid batteries that need to be put into those cabinets yeah. and to, to manage um, power outages as well. So there's a significant um, footprint of lead-acid batteries uh, as well as what you're talking about there, the fan, the, the cooling, the, um, the soundproofing of, the, of these cabinets. So, yeah, uh, essentially what you're saying is correct, that the, um, the same sort of infrastructure will be required for any fibre to the node infrastructure or fibre to the cabinet, sometimes it's called, would be required. It's, it's the principle behind those types of networks where these are put, um, obviously, on street um, verges, on nature strips and the like. When we met the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Enterprise, uh, they indicated to us that there had been long-term problems in New Zealand with the copper, that uh, they were old pressurised cables, that uh, they had leaks that had to continually be... The cable had to be continually dug up because of leaks in the pressurised cable and they had to be fixed. And in the 70s, there was copper directly buried uh, in the ground in New Zealand and uh, that there was huge costs to, to retrofit, uh, to make this copper into you know, a, a reasonably performing uh, operation. And that's why they decided to sc the, the new government decided to scrap that approach and go to an all fiber to the home uh, approach. Is that a similar problem we would face with the copper in Australia? <clears throat> Clearly what we're talking about there is, is Telstra's network, so I don't want to go into too much um, um, detail. Obviously not aware of all of the issues that we would have uh, if uh, you were looking to put a fibre to the node network in. But suffice to say there would be similar issues in certain locations. Some, some areas will be better than others, um, but there would be a, an upgrade required to be able to make sure that the, the copper network was able to perform at, um, at a standard that it enabled the, the higher broadband speeds to be achieved. The, the, the quality of the copper network is a very fundamental part of delivering broadband in a fibre to the node architecture. Without good quality network, it becomes problematic to be able to provide any guarantees with speeds. Speeds may actually fluctuate from, from time to time, day to day, during wet season and, and, and so on with different climatic events. So that, those are certainly issues for any copper network. And, and could I just add, uh, and uh, I think Mr McLaren's being very uh, uh, measured in his response, if you were to go to sites like Willpool, you will find extensive discussions on the poor quality of Australia's copper. And I can recommend a number of uh, threads and a number of uh, posters who have got personal experience and extensive industry experience where they will describe uh, the state of Australia's copper network. Experts have calculated there could be costs of up to a billion dollars uh, to just to maintain the existing copper network. And I stress the word maintain 
the existing copper network at its current standard, not actually make sure it could deliver the sorts of performance that uh, some are claiming for it. Uh, and I uh, could particularly point, as I said, to a number of threads on Willpool, a number of posters. Uh, I think if you were to read uh, Tailgater, Ungulate, JW, BAM, extensive conversations, uh, extensive conversations uh, which will reveal to you the poor state of Australia's existing copper network. And for claims to be made that the, you can transfer speeds that have been delivered in the United Kingdom, transfer speeds that were delivered in the United Kingdom onto Australia's copper uh, would just be farcical. But that is what some are attempting to do, Senator Cameron. I'm, I appreciate you're not one of them. And there are many other posters on Whirlpool, not just the ones I've mentioned there, many other who will give a chapter and verse uh, mm -hmm. about why you cannot rely on Australia's ageing and creaking copper network to deliver the speeds that are claimed in the United Kingdom. Mm. And Mr Fletcher sort of uh, made a big issue of the number of homes that had been passed, and I emphasise passed, uh, by the rollout in New Zealand. Uh, one of the companies that we met were Northern Power. Now, Northern Power are an actual electricity supply distribution company. And they, some years ago, uh, decided that they would use their transmission lines to provide a local network of uh, broadband. Uh, they have now got an area in New Zealand that they are supplying and they're doing it through the, the, power, uh, the power lines there. Uh, they are seen as being the, the pin-up uh, of the, the, the rollout uh, in New Zealand because it, they claim it's quicker because you're using the existing uh, electricity power lines. But what Mr Fletcher is not saying in his article, and I want to get your views on this, he's not saying that he's not telling people in the article that this is, this is just passing the home. None of the... Uh, these companies are actually connecting to the home at this stage. Are you aware of that? In terms of, and in, in that would be showing up in activation rates, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, we, we have read in, the, in what's available in the public arena in terms of the activation rates, and, and Jim was closely, and maybe if you take it in terms of how that compares to Australia. Yeah, so I think in the fibre footprint which we have at the moment, the activation rates or the take-up rates are about 15% across all of the sites. My understanding, the latest figures we've seen from New Zealand, it's about 1.6%, so it's, um, it's quite a bit, uh, bit different there. I think also in terms of kind of the numbers of the rollout, if you like, comparing the New Zealand number, my understanding is that the, the um, New Zealand rollout goes to 2019 and passes something like 100,000 or so homes a year. Um, the MBN rollout goes to 2021 and will be passing something like 1.2, 1.3 million homes a year. So it's quite a different scale, you know, it's a really quite a different scale. Yeah, so it's not really comparing <coughs> apples with apples, is it? Um, now, I now want to turn to Chorus. Um, now, Chorus uh, are doing a lot of the metropolitan work, and uh, they... What I was told by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Enterprise is that tel telecom have not got a service offering until February, March next year. Now, they're indicating that they hope that that will speed up the take-up. That's the, that's the retail uh, offering. Um, are we, will we have uh, retail offerings uh, available for customers that want to move on uh, within Australia? Yes, we've got those now. So there's over, well, there's now 46 service providers uh, have signed the contracts with um, NBN Co. And uh, 31 service providers actually providing services across NBN Co. And I think to that point you were making there, the difference is that um, across the service provider market, the existing broadband market, um, it's in excess of 95% of um, 
providers across that broadband market have signed up with the MBN Co, so market share in excess of 95%. My understanding is in New Zealand, the top three service providers have still to actually bring products out um, for that marketplace. So again, it's quite a bit different, the um, take up between the service providers in the two countries. And one of the interesting uh, issues that Chorus raised um, was that uh, the fibre network had less had far less faults than the copper network, and they would not be uh, doing any more new copper. In fact, that what they said to us was that the the fibre network would eat up the copper network over time. Is that your understanding? In New yes. Zealand, yes. yes, yeah, I wonder. And it's clearly what we're looking to do here with the, the decommissioning of the, the copper network as we as we go forward. So. So that, that part of the New Zealand rollout and our rollout, the eventual uh, position is to eat up the copper network. And uh, uh, Chorus indicated to us that uh, there would be a point where the copper would be turned off uh, across the country. And they indicated that that was in their long-term interest. This is the, the actual owner of the copper at the I mean, moment so in, in, are saying they want... Yeah, is is that enough. a similar proposition here? And I want it similar to, if I refer to that previous question, where if I understand it was about the maintenance costs of the copper, which, um, and the, and which relates to the faults and the number of faults that you get on, and it is widely regarded that there would be more faults on, uh, on copper infrastructure. And, and the cost of maintaining the copper infrastructure isn't getting less expensive, it's getting more expensive over time as it ages. So natural. therefore migrating more of your business to... A, uh, a network which requires less maintenance costs um, would would make a lot of business sense, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And Chorus indicated that they were looking for an uptake of it 20% 20, 20 by 2020. Um, is that comparable with where we are going? Uh, no, we are, we are looking for a, a much higher rate um, than that as, as we look to to 70%. offer services 70% that um, in the remaining 30% um, being half choosing to mm -hmm. choose mobile and half are unoccupied. Um, so, yeah, quite a lot higher than that. They indicated that the demand curve in New Zealand was completely unknown. Uh, you know, so I, I'm just wondering why Mr Fletcher would say it's such a great you know, proposition that that demand curve is, is, is unknown in New Zealand. What's our demand curve expectations? Look, I think one of, the, one of the points that was raised before is that with the three major retail service providers not currently offering services, it's really hard to get a sense of what actually the demand would be. Whereas in Australia, where we have very active retail service provider activity on top of the MBN, and we're already seeing great uptake of 15%, as Mr Hassel mentioned, and in some areas over 40%, um, that we can already start to see that there is a, a fair level of demand. And we think that as we've now uh, started the notification process of decommissioning, that will also create a, a further incentive to switch over to the MBN. The chorus were, you know, very good in terms of being open about the problems. You know, it's distinct from what Mr Fletcher saying that everything is so great in New Zealand, what they indicated to us was that um, the whole rollout was extremely hard to manage across all of the areas that they had coverage for and that they had underestimated the scale uh, of the problem. Have we managed to estimate the scale of the issues that we are dealing with sufficiently? I believe so, is that we, um, we, have, we, we acknowledge this is a, a nationwide piece of infrastructure um, and uh, as such it's a large challenge but we have been systematically going through the process and, and I know Mr Quigley has gone to great pains to explain often the process uh, and, and, and focusing on each step of that process whether that be within our control um, or a step that is taken on behalf of us through a contractor and we are improving that at every step. And maybe as, a, as an example, the network design documents that are really at the heart of our rollout, if we take it back a year, we were completing about three a month. Uh, we are now completing about 35 a month. So that gives you a sense of the ramp up there. And, and possibly to get another reference point there, is that at full scale, we'd be looking to do around 
45 a month. So you can see we're already starting to, to build that ramp up. Hmm. The court has indicated to us that one of the challenges for them was competition for resources, competition for resources with, with Australia and other overseas countries, and that was for drilling crews and jointers. Uh, are we managing that, uh, are contractors managing that challenge? I believe. Uh, yes, we, we've, we're obviously working through the contractors. We mentioned there the names of the, the initial work packages we're using for the fibre builds, but we're also looking to deepen that with further releases of work packages over the over the next uh, uh, months and years to be able to, to further deepen and also extend the, the number of companies that are working on the MBN in, uh, in different areas. So it, it is a case of ramping up, as, as Mr mm. Cooney said. We're going through a, a phase where the lead indicators now are really showing that we're, mm. we're climbing up the, the curve necessary to build this network and we're starting to see the, the need to obviously ramp up the, the different phases of the build and the contractors are, are well with, uh, within what we're expecting them to do. They also indicated to us that they were running into problems with local councils. We've had some evidence about that tonight, so that's not any different uh, to us, but they, were, they had local council issues. They also said utility strikes were frequent uh, because of the utility records were not accurate, that you know they were striking yeah, yeah, gas yeah. pipes, water pipes, yeah, yeah, and the like, that. and this was a huge problem for them. That. One of one of the good things yeah. about our network is that we are have got our deal with Very Telstra with to problem. reuse the the Telstra ducts in in New Zealand. There there has is not such an extensive underground duct network. You mentioned before a lot of the copper network was direct buried. Yeah. Um, and that creates a problem because effectively for the fibre network you have to go and do a lot of digging, a lot of trenching and you do hit the, the sort of issues with utilities and so on. In our build, because we are predominantly reusing existing duct infrastructure, the, the risk of um, having those sort of events are, are less. They will still happen, but they, and we will obviously look to manage them as best we can, but the risk is certainly less because of the existing infrastructure that we're using as part of the, the Telstra deal. And they, they also said there was another problem that they, they were, were grappling with continually, and that was uh, designs from head office not reflecting the topography that they were dealing with. Yeah, is, that, we, is that a common issue well, for, yeah, for this industry? Some of that. There's, <laughs> but we do have that in the process. We, actually, we have a head office design, which is the end network design document that um, Mr Cooney mentioned, but then we actually go out and do a field verification. So uh, there's a, essentially a phase that anticipates that the records that we, we receive um, about the pit and pipe network aren't necessarily accurate, and we actually do have to go and check what is actually there, make sure the condition of it is um, appropriate to, to be able to draw the fibre through. So we do an extensive field verification. And that's what we've been doing over the last, um, last months. It's been going through that necessary field verification, design documents that are necessary to be able to produce the, the 30, 40, 50 um, FSAMs per month that we're putting into the build program as we speak. Senator Conroy. Yeah, so I just, uh, I, did, I did want to, because uh, we're about to finish, just make one point. Senator Birmingham's just tweeted, uh, and it is embarrassing, but I am going to reveal it. He says, Labor has just 24,000 connections, and we've revealed 9,000 came from the Howard government what's broadband what's program. Twitter Let's be very account? clear. 9,000 Howard order. government what's customers what's your, have order? abandoned the Howard government program and swapped Third. to the NBN. 9,000 people have quit the Howard government program and more would, except yeah, we won't let them. You ended the Howard, Howard government program last 9, year. Your government scrapped it last year. They can't, get six, up. They can't year. get six down and one up. They can't get six down and one up. So, so, okay. so just don't talk you about it fraud. being abandoned or people you know, you are jumping a away from it. You well, ended well, it. Well, order. They can't order. get you're the fraud. They can't get a service this order. I'm glad. I'm glad to. Order. Order. I'm glad to. 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 I'm glad I'm glad to see we have fit. Oh, he started it. You sound like a school kid. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see that we finished the way we started, but we've actually managed to get our way through till 11 o'clock. So we have now uh, finished our uh, questioning of NBN. Thanks very much to NBN, the officers of the department, for coming along. Um, I, that concludes our examination of the broadband communications and the digital economy portfolio. Senators are reminded that written questions on notice 
should be provided to the Secretariat by close of business next Wednesday, the 24th of October. I thank ministers and officers for their attendance, and Hansard and Broadcasting, and the Secretariat staff. Thank you. Well done. We got through.